Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Button, Leader of the Government in the Senate. And on this occasion, which we expect to be his uh, last day in last question time as uh, Minister of the Crown, I thought we should give him the opportunity to the opportunity to again address the major issue facing this country, and that's the that's the economic crisis. So, Minister, I ask you, as the as the trend estimate of full-time employment, the trend estimate of full-time employment under your policies continues to decline with last month's seasonally adjusted figures showing another 78,000 jobs lost. Can you assure the people of Australia, and particularly the young people coming onto the job market, that by early next year unemployment won't have reached the figure of 12 per cent? Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Mr President, uh, I've said on a number of occasions in the Senate in the past, I repeat it. Uh, what the government did in the last year's budget was to estimate uh, the uh, level of unemployment by the uh, middle of next year. Uh, Mr Dawkins has already uh, uh, commented publicly as Treasurer that he feels that the uh, estimate in the budget may not be attained, and I'm uh, not going to add to any speculation about unemployment, unemployment, unemployment figures. Let me just say it will depend on the capacity of this economy to grow. Uh, Senator Short yesterday asked me questions about uh, the growth estimates for this economy, and, uh, and I, uh, I, have, uh, I have nothing to add to that. Senator Collins has referred, uh, by way of interjection, to the OECD figures on growth. Let me, uh, let, let me just. Order. Let me just say that in terms of those OECD figures, uh, Australia is by uh, 1994 uh, will be one of will be the fifth highest growth economy in the OECD. In 1993, it will be the fourth highest growth economy in the OECD, and uh, both those things are relevant, of course, to the question of uh, international levels of growth and unemployment, consequent upon. Uh, the low growth rates which have now been suggested for a number of countries. So uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, Senator, going to uh, make predictions about that. I, I sincerely hope that that will not be the case, but I'm not making predictions about it. Supplementary, Senator Hill. Well, Mr President, as the, uh, the OECD's estimate of growth rate for Australia will be at a level insufficient to reduce the unemployment level in this country, I therefore ask you, as I've asked you on recent days, is the government going to offer anything new at all, any change in economic direction that's going to give the unemployed in this country hope, a chance of future work, or is all this government going to do in its last few months in office offer more of the same? Minister, Senator Button. Well, Mr. Mr President, uh, I think it's very important that uh, governments uh, maintain a level of uh, consistency and stability in what they do, uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to change our policies on the basis of uh, uh, not, not, not. Well, Senator, the unemployed have been there for a fair while, yeah, but but the but the opinion polls Order. the opinion polls, Senator, Order. were the things which touched off your changes to policies which you said would solve all these problems. You've been yelling your head off for a year, for 12 months, telling us about fight back and how it will solve the problems of this country, and you don't even know what's in it, Senator Knowles. You tell people in Western Australia different things from what's in fight back itself, and uh, you should go back and rectify that dreadful mistake you made on, uh, on radio in Western Australia. Now, I know you don't want to hear this, but it's... Uh, yeah. Uh, Senator Senator Button Senator Kemp. was asked a very clear question to tell us what his policies are to deal with the problems that his policies have created, and is he going to have any new policies? I ask you to instruct Senator Button to, to return turn to the, the, uh, the question and either give a proper answer or sit down. President, I find it incredible that Senator Kemp raises a point of order asking you to redirect Senator Button on a question when he has two seconds to go. Yeah. Mr. Order, order. 
Senator Button was asked a specific question, but he was not helped by the interjections, and, I, and he was answering interjections for the last part of that large minute, and I would ask senators from both sides to cease interjecting. Se Mr uh, President, uh, question time is not a time to announce uh, new or different Order. policies, and I will not Order. be doing that. Order. Senator Charles, and I remind senators again that I will tell the Speaker when time's up. I've been allowing people to finish their sentence from both sides. Senator Charles. Mr President, I address a question to Senator Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. Is it true that the individual work contract being forced on some Victorian employees of the company Copperart cuts their wages by $41.86 per week? Is it also true that the Coalition supports the introduction of this type of work contract as a replacement for a fair award system, and in, and in particular supported the Copperart contract, Senator Parra asserting, as does Copperart, that their individual work contract means a wage increase of $29 per week, even with 10 hours overtime. Is Copperart misleading the community, and is Senator Parra misleading the Senate? Has Senator Harradine offered to arbitrate on whether these employees will be better off as a result of this contract? Do you accept this offer? What is the proof that copyright individual work contract results in a wage cut and ass assertions to the contrary are misleading? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Mr President, the answer to the first five questions is yes. Yes, the copyright contract cuts wages by $41.86 per week. Yes, the opposition favoured this type of contract, and Senator Perra contended that with 10 hours overtime it in fact increases wages by $29 per week. Yes, both Copper Art and Senator Perra are misleading, respectively the community and the Senate. Yes, as I understand it from Hansard, Senator Harradine made such an offer. And yes, if that offer is still open, the government is prepared to accept Senator Harradine to arbitrate the matter between us. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, I am asked what is the proof. Mr. President, uh, if an attendant can step forward, I table the proof. There is a copy of this for Senator Perra, for Senator Bell from the, uh, from the Democrats, and for Senator Harradine. I table the documents. Mr. Uh, President, the uh, documents are in the form of legal proof containing a number of exhibits. Exhibit 1 is the copyright contract. Exhibit 2 is a certified copy of the award. Exhibit 3 is their Christmas catalogue. Exhibit 4 is a note from my department. Exhibit 5 is a statutory declaration by the union. Exhibit 6 is a copy of the wages clause of the award issued by the Victorian Commission. Exhibit 7 is a statutory declaration from the secretary of the Victorian branch of the union. Exhibit 8 is, a, is the Copper Art press release unsigned, issued on the, on the 2nd of December and undated. And uh, Exhibit 9 is a comparison of wage rates under Copper Art contract and the Victorian Electrical Furniture and Hardware Shops Award 1991. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, these documents prove to the proper legal standard that we are right, the opposition is wrong. The figures that I have contended that uh, this contract cuts are true. The figures that the opposition alleges that it uh, increases wages are wrong and are misleading and should be withdrawn, lest the opposition want to be part of promoting a lie in the broad community. Mr. President, uh, what the Copper Art contract does is in fact force on workers in Victoria a reduction in their standards below those of the award. It is supported by the opposition, who have supported the exploitation of vulnerable workers in this way. It is in keeping with the Kennett Hewson industrial relations policy. It is why this government will not support an individual work contract approach, why we support the protection of properly determined by uh, award wages decided by an independent arbitral authority when there is, when there is disagreement between workers and employers. I table the uh, documents for the Senate and ask an attendant, a parliamentary attendant, to distribute them to Senators Order. Perra, Bell and Harrity. Order. Parliamentary question. Order. For uh, ministers to engage in stunts of this nature, documents can be tabled. Documents can be tabled, and I'm sure we'd have no objection, but uh, there's certainly no provision that would enable uh, or let alone require attendants yes. to, to uh, be part and parcel of a stunt of this nature.
Order, order. It is quite in order for the minister to table the document and ask that it be circulated. Senator Charles. Mr. President, supplementary question. In view of the answer, does the government propose to introduce a system of individual work contracts and the power of one party to veto the right of the other party to fair arbitration if there is a disagreement? Minister. We will not introduce Senator the Cook. sort of policy that the Kennett government in Victoria has introduced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We stand for dignified treatment of workers in the workplace, not exploitation. We stand for the proper protections of an award, access to fair arbitration where there is a dispute, and a provision for the proper flexibilities for enterprise negotiations so that uh, productivity improvements can be achieved. Mr. President, uh, over Christmas, work uh, sorry, over Christmas, copper art employees may be under pressure to, to accept these individual work contracts. I ask Australians, if they shop at copper art over Christmas, to let the shop assistant know who serves you that you're on their side and that you want the and you support their right to proper award protection. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Senator Button, representing the uh, Treasurer, <coughs> and I refer that I refer the Minister to the work that has been done within the Australian Taxation Office and the Treasury in recent months for the introduction of the new tax on services that the government will introduce in 1993 if it were to win the uh, next election. <coughs> and I ask, one, can he provide the Senate with the specific details of the tax? Two, has the government yet determined the rate of the tax and, if so, what that rate would be? And three, would the new tax be introduced in the 1993 budget uh, or earlier? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator well, Button. Senator Short's a bit of a desperate, real desperate. This matter has not been to the government. It's never been discussed by the government, not been considered. And uh, I know that uh, Treasury does uh, work all the time on various tax options like, uh, which, which, uh, which are available on international tax comparisons, things of that kind. And, uh, uh, Senator, to... Uh, suggest that the government has any uh, commitment or even knowledge uh, of this proposed tax is rubbish. Supplementary. Yep. Uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I ask as a supplementary uh, uh, the Minister, one, will he categorically deny that the Australian Taxation Office and the Treasury have been working on the details for the implementation of a new tax on services? And two, if the government is not proposing to introduce a new tax on services, which constitutes 60 per cent of the economy, then what other new taxes will it be introducing to fund the enormous $30 billion hole in its budget over the three years of the next parliament? Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, um, first of all, let me say that uh, I have no idea of what work the Treasury is doing on various taxes, and I'm not an I'm not in position. Well, I mean, Order. Senator Short, you ought to go into the law and prosecute drunks in the Williamstown court or something like that, asking questions of that kind. Asking questions of that kind. The fact of the matter is, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, as the OECD report said the other day, Senator, Australia is in a position. Uh, Australia is in a position to move to use government spending to boost the economy as distinct from most other economies in the world. So if you don't understand the answer, you might as well be quiet. Now, <clears throat> let me say that uh, I'll, I'll make inquiries about, uh, about your question, but uh, as I said before, there is no proposal or consideration of this kind before, before government. I will, I will not come back to the Senate this afternoon. Don't be ridiculous. There is only one thing reasonably certain in this life that if the opposition Order. were elected, some sort of GST, whatever Button. shape it will be, will be imposed. Senator Button. Order. I wish to acknowledge the presence in uh, the gallery, my gallery to the left, of uh, Senator Kemp Hannan from New York State and his wife Bomlin wish, and on behalf of all senators, wish them well on their visit to Australia. Yeah. Senator Colston. Probably. Mr President, I direct a question to Senator Tate in his capacity as Minister representing the Attorney General. I refer to a confirmation by Mr Rodney Adler that his FAI insurances purchased Westpac rights to affect the Australian share price index so that FAI could profit from futures linked to that index. 
Did the Australian Securities Commission undertake an investigation into FAI's purchase of, of Westpac rights and its subsequent profit from an increase in the share price index? If so, what are the results of that in investigation? Finally, is the Australian government satisfied with a system which allows individuals or companies to manipulate the stock market for their own speculative benefit? The uh, Minister for Justice representing the Attorney General, Senator Tate. Mr. President, I haven't seen the confirmation which uh, Senator uh, Colston refers to uh, about remarks by Mr. Rodney Adler uh, about the involvement of uh, FAI insurance in purchasing Westpac rights to affect the Australian share price market index. But I, I do understand that the Australian Securities Commission naturally, uh, as part of its responsibilities, monitors developments in the securities market. I have been informed that the Australian Securities Commission is aware of the transactions referred to by the Honourable Senator, and uh, of course the Australian Securities Commission is considering the matters raised uh, in the context of those transactions. Naturally, the Australian Securities Commission, as is its uh, proper role as an independent statutory body, will make its uh, investigation without any uh, prejudice or interference uh, from any remarks made either in this chamber or certainly from the federal government. As to Senator uh, Colston's more general question about whether the Australian government is satisfied, as he put it, with a system which allows uh, individuals or companies to manipulate the stock market for their own speculative gains. Quite clearly, in setting up the Australian Securities Commission, in establishing for the first time companies and securities legislation which uh, has a nationwide uh, uh, effect uh, rather than the fragmented uh, federalised uh, system that allowed the speculative excesses of the 1980s to get out of hand and damage Australia's credibility and certainly the uh, av availability of investor uh, monies uh, through having confidence in the Australian market, whether from uh, domestic sources or from overseas. All that has been remedied by the Commonwealth Government taking very firm steps to establish the Australian Securities Commission in its independent stance. And, uh, I believe that uh, certainly in relation to insider trading, the various reforms, Senator, which have been passed through this chamber, through the, uh, through the Senate over the last uh, 12 months or so, to do with insider trading, make it very clear of our commitment to a well-regulated market so that uh, insider trading does not occur, or if it does occur, is identified very quickly and, uh, and action is taken to punish those involved. Um, Senator Bourne. My question is also to Senator Tate, representing the Attorney General. I ask: Is the Minister aware that the racist British author, Mr David Irving, is currently soliciting speaking engagements in Australia during March 1993? Is the Minister also aware that Mr Irving was recently prevented from entering Canada, Italy and Germany on the grounds of his violently racist views? And is the government in a position to use anti-vilification laws now in place in New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and the ACT? And being coming into place in, in the Commonwealth to prevent Mr Irving from propounding his racial vilification and hatred in this country. The Minister for Justice, representing Attorney General, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, the claim by Senator Bourne in her question that uh, Mr David Irving was recently prevented from entering, I think it was Canada, Italy and Germany, was it, on the grounds of violently racist views, as was put by Senator Bourne. I do know that uh, Mr Irving has lodged an application in London for seeking to uh, arrive in Australia as a visitor, I think, about March the 17th of next year. Uh, this is a visitor visa application and, of course, it will be referred to the minister when he uh, considers these matters, uh, perhaps in late January, uh, in the normal course of, uh, of, of uh, these matters reaching his desk, uh, in order, I would imagine, to uh, understand better the application or possible application of the controversial visitor uh, categories which are administered uh, within the Department of Immigration uh, and Ethnic Affairs. For example, in the public interest criteria, uh, there is provision for uh, consideration of the visa in terms of whether the minister acting personally considers that it's like that the uh, person making application is likely to become involved in activities disruptive to uh, the Australian community or a group within the Australian community. And again, under the good character of provisions, the question of whether Mr Irving has been deported from another country, uh, as has been suggested, I understand, in some media, uh, would also be relevant to consider. Senator Bourne asks about uh, anti-vilification legislation. As I understand it, Senator, whilst there are such laws in place in various jurisdictions uh, throughout Australia—I think New South Wales, Queensland 
and a couple of other states. Quite clearly, whether in fact there was transgression of such laws would be a matter for those jurisdictions, and uh, they would enforce such laws, no doubt, if there was any uh, suggestion that uh, Mr Irving or anyone else was, uh, was, had transgressed them. So, uh, as to our own racial vilification laws, I think they were introduced in the House of Representatives uh, perhaps only last night, but they're not to be passed, of course, until the autumn session of the Parliament. So, in the case of Mr Irving, I would imagine that uh, if he was present in Australia and engaged in such activities as uh, suggested, he might be subject to state uh, uh, laws in that regard, and uh, that would be a matter for state authorities. Senator Loosley. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is directed to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button, and it follows the question which I asked yesterday about the TCF industries and their future. Is the Minister able to provide details of the Federal Government grant provided to Chargeurs Textiles Proprietary Limited to enable the company to expand its superfine wool processing capacity in the city of Wagga Wagga? Has the Minister seen negative comments regarding this decision, and does the Government have an effective response to this criticism? What is the position of the Federal Government? The Minister of Industry, Technology and Commerce, Grant, uh, made to uh, the company Chargeurs in Wagga by the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Development Authority under uh, its further wool processing program. That will lead to the expansion and modernisation of this uh, top-making plant at Wagga. Uh, $62 million will be invested. The plant will earn an additional $120 million in export earnings per year and an additional 90 jobs will be uh, created. This uh, move has been welcomed by the New South Wales Government as an example of cooperation between state and federal governments. But it is true, Senator, that I have also noticed some uh, criticism of the project. Uh, for example, the uh, opposition spokesman on industry, Mr McLaughlin, said yesterday that Australians should feel outraged by this grant. Now, uh, why does Mr McLaughlin say that uh, Australians should feel outraged? Because he says it is a French company. It is a French company. A French company, which I might point out has been uh, processing Australian wool in Wagga for 11 years. And uh, what is the point of this identification in a country which uh, has a uh, significant share of foreign investment in manufacturing industry, of saying we should be outraged because it's a French company? The opposition tried this stunt in Geelong earlier this year with the German company BWK. The member for Karangamite went round Geelong saying this is a German company, therefore it shouldn't get any government assistance. And uh, this is an extraordinary message for a uh, potential or possible alternative government to send to foreign investors and say, and say this, uh, no, no, you'll have to do better than this. This is the point I'm making, because fancy an alternative government sending this message. If you're a French company, we don't want you. If you're a German company, we don't want you. But what did Mr McLaughlin say this morning when he was asked to give examples of Australian companies which might have uh, had received assistance under this program? There are nine pages of them in the TCFDA report tabled in the Senate yesterday. Nine pages of Australian companies that have received assistance. But what did Mr McLaughlin say this morning on Townsville Radio when asked to identify Australian companies he referred to Michelle's. He referred to Michelle's in Adelaide and other Japanese companies. Other Japanese companies. So the message of the opposition is this: that if you are going to invest in Australia, be very careful about your nationality. If you're French, you're no good this week. If you're Germans, you were no good last month. If you're Japanese, it's okay. Now that is the message that these remarks are sending to international investors in Australia. And it is, really is a grubby, grubby point, a grubby point to, to try and disguise Mr. McLaughlin's deep-seated ideological opposition to the role of government, to the role of government in assisting Order. Australian industry. Senator McGup McGibbon. Nine. Thank you, You're Mr. Not. President. You're not. My, question, my question, without notice, is to Senator Collins. I refer to your stubborn refusal to entertain that any allegations raised by parliamentarians from both sides of the parliament about the Civil Aviation Authority's TATS contract were accurate and which have now been proved to be so in the McPhee report. And I won't bore the Senate with going through all your quotations, but they're best encapsulated in the quotation, and I quote, a number of claims have been made about irregularities some of them quite extraordinary and defamatory in aspects of the process followed by the CAA in relation to this project. 
There is no evidence to support any of those claims. <laughs> Minister, since if you've not resigned, when are you going to do the honourable course and resign? The Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, as I advised the Senate yesterday when the, uh, the, there was a debate on this matter, the processes to establish the independent inquiry Order. that was in fact held were begun by me and would have been concluded by me uh, had uh, Senator Richardson's resignation not occurred and I had moved out of the portfolio. That is a matter of record, Mr President, which can be confirmed, of course, by the two senior officers of my department, the secretary and the associate secretary, who conferred with me uh, on this matter. And uh, I must say I had a very useful and I found productive uh, hour or so, or perhaps it wasn't quite an hour, with Mr McPhee uh, today uh, discussing uh, that report. But the facts are, Mr President, although Senator McGibbon would like to, uh, to hide from them, is that the substantive number of allegations made by Senator McGibbon were Order. all rebutted by the McPhee report. And to put in context these claims again, and I have uh, great pleasure uh, Mr. President, in highlighting this again, the most outrageous of these allegations made by Senator McGibbon, with careless abandon, I might add, were that people had behaved corruptly. And those allegations, Mr. President, included me. And my colleagues will recall who were in here at the time, and I see them nodding in assent, that those outrageous allegations that people were receiving kickbacks, kickbacks were made with careless abandon, not just for the reputation order, order, of the individuals order, involved, McDonald. but more importantly, in my view, in absolutely careless abandon of the reputations of the reputable companies concerned who would have to have been parties to such corrupt practices. And I am delighted that not only did Mr McPhee lay that outrageous allegation of Senator McGibbon to rest, but he confirmed it, I thought, in a very succinct way in his interview on AM this morning. Supplementary, Senator McGibbon. Mr President, I never at any stage accused people of corruption. I said I was hearing allegations of corruption, and for a limited intellect by Senator Collins, I can understand Order. he can't understand the difference. But in the light of his answer, how does he reconcile the finding of the report that the advice to the board by Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards is fatally flawed? It was inadequately researched and tested. Hughes were not assessed fairly. That was the burden of the criticism from both sides of the parliament. What's your answer to that? Minister, Senator Collins. Mr President, the facts of the matter were, and they have been, I think, well laid out in the McPhee report, that these were two competent, reputable and technically proficient companies that entered into a very close contest. And in fact, if Senator McGibbon wants to refer to the actual points that were allocated uh, to every single one of the criteria of both these companies, they will find out that in every single criteria they were literally one or two points apart in an overall score of 100. It was a tight contest. On the crucial question of the complicated and technical issue of the number of lines of computer code that were contained in the flight data processing heart of that system, from personal experience as a non-expert, can I tell you, an area that causes everyone's eyes to glaze over if you're not a computer engineer, it was found that a risk did exist, did exist in the Hughes bid, but that uh, Dr Edwards had placed undue weight on that risk. Now, for that, he stands criticised, and it's now a matter for the board. And of course, as Mr McPhee confirmed again with me today, the primary responsibility, as his report uh, lays out, is with those two named individuals uh, in that report. It's now a matter, following the government investigation, Order. for the board to determine what will Order. happen with those individuals. Order. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. I address my question uh, to the Minister for Industrial Relations. Has the minister seen the report of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's inquiry into sex discrimination in regard to over-award payments? Does this report show that women workers would be disadvantaged under a system where pay was negotiated between an employer and an individual employee. The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I have seen the report prepared by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. It does find, as uh, Senator Reynolds in her question has uh, suggested, that there is in fact discrimination in over-award negotiations. 
Now, this is a relevant uh, question, Mr. President, because it does touch on the difference between the two major parties in Australia on industrial relations. What the report finds is where there is access to independent arbitration to, in, a, in the event of a dispute over wages, determine a fair wage, the earnings gap between men and women in Australia has closed. And in fact, we have one of the smallest gaps between women and men's wages of any country in the OECD. But where negotiation has taken place between workers and employers for over-award uh, payments, and classically that negotiation is uh, if, uh, if a union is not present between the individual worker and the employer, then the wages gap between men and women has opened widely and that women have come off second best and are the, the, uh, the poor wage cousins or sisters of men in those circumstances. Mr President, the report found uh, as well that there the report found well they are the facts, Senator, and I'm surprised that you should be one that would query them. Because under Order. your system, should we Order. ever have it should we ever see it in Australia under your system, women would be clearly worse off. And that is not that is not an objective that this government wants to see. Because as I said in an earlier answer today, we stand for fair wage determination and fair treatment between men and women in the determination of wages. Mr President, in contrast to the coalition, we uh, we have uh, just recently extended the Sex Discrimination Act to cover new awards and certified workplace agreements. Workers can now bring complaints relating to discrimination in both their, their award and over-award pay to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. We have also announced our intention to legislate to guarantee equal pay for work of equal value for men and women, fair minimum wages and protections against unfair dismissals for all workers. The government rejects and protects the re rejects. Sorry, the government respects the, the, the government respects and protects the uh, the right of women to a fair deal in the labour market. And uh, while I uh, appreciate that Senator Newman has maintained a constant stream of interjection here to put me off the case, in, it, thus, <laughs> thus in order thus in order to prevent the facts getting out. This report by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner is profound on this point. Is profound on this point. Women would be worse off under you. Women in employment, much better off under us. Senator Bone, Mr. President, Order. Mr. Senator Mr. President my question without notice is addressed to Senator Button. I refer the minister to the meeting he had on Thursday, November the 26th, with Dr. Bella Kadar the Hungarian Minister for International Economic Relations, followed by meetings with Dr Kadar by Treasurer Dawkins, Foreign Affairs and Trade Minister Evans, and a previous meeting in Hungary with Trade Minister Kerin. What government-to-government -government discussions or negotiations have taken place relating to a joint venture outlined by Dr Kadar between the Prime Minister's half-owned piggery group, Brown and Hatton, and the Hungarian Zeged small goods group for a $50 million project, 35 per cent owned by the Hungarians at Scone in New South Wales? Now that a letter of intent has been signed under which a pilot salami project is to proceed, I ask the Minister to explain why there is not a massive conflict of interest involved in the Prime Minister standing to gain a substantial benefit as a half owner of Brown and Hatton as a result of intergovernmental negotiations involving considerable work by Austrade and Australian government agency. Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Order. Mr President, I had a uh, meeting with uh, Dr Bella Kadar on the uh, 20th of November. It was described by him as a courtesy call, C-O-U-R-T-E-S-Y, in case, Senator Bohm, you don't understand the word. It was a courtesy call. No arrangements were discussed about, uh, uh, <coughs> of any kind relating to trade or investment matters. And uh, <coughs> that, uh, that, that is all that happened in the course of that discussion. Might I just say, uh, say to Senator Bohm, uh, you know, <coughs> why don't you perhaps take the view of the Canberra Times article yesterday, which said that if you really want to get answers to these questions, Dr Hewson should have the courage to ask the questions in the House of Representatives. Dr Hewson Dr. should have the courage to ask them in the House of Representatives. Order. I know it was my meeting. I know it was my meeting, but the point is nothing to do with my meeting, Senator, as you well know. 
and uh, that, that he should have the courage to ask these questions in the House of Representatives. Now he's become, you know, Mr. Listener, Dr. Listener, all around the country, like Billy Hughes, putting out his ear trumpet to hear the signals. And uh, after the election, if he was uh, successful, he wouldn't hear any more. Uh, that, that's the posture which is now adopted. But uh, Senator Bohm, uh, <coughs> these uh, these questions, as the Canberra Times uh, <coughs> commented yesterday. Uh, should be asked by a courageous opposition in the place where perhaps they can more directly be answered. Instead of which, he uses his uh, uh, how failed shadow minister, his failed shadow minister, 21 questions this year, one of them about his shadow portfolio. He uses him in the Senate to do this sort of thing for Point him. of order. Now that's Senator Ocho. Point of order, Mr. President. Senator Button said this before about Senator Boehm. He of course, neglects all the speeches Senator Bowman has made about his portfolio, about dozens and dozens and dozens of questions he's asked in estimates. And I really feel that this is a personal reflection on Senator Bohm, on his integrity, or on his capacity to act as a shadow minister. And I would suggest that he be he be asked not to, to order, reflect. Order. Like there is no point of order, but I would suggest to Senator Bowman he's beginning to debate the issue. Well, Mr. President, it's not a, certainly not a personal reflection on Senator Bohm. I would not do that. It's a reflection on his professional capacity as a senator, and he shouldn't, uh, he shouldn't lower himself. He shouldn't lower himself to this sort of thing at the behest, at the behest of a leader in the House of Representatives who doesn't have the courage to do it himself and wants to be regarded as Mr. Clean, even if he's Mr. Confused. Su supplementary question. Supplementary. Mr. Senator President, Bain. I ask the minister why these questions can't be answered honestly and in substance in Parliament, which is this place here. And I further ask, as the ability of the Prime Minister's piggery group to repay Mr. John Brown the four million dollars I'd owed to him depends on the success of multinational deals involving government-to-government -government negotiations, and as Mr. Brown was involved in initiating this deal this year in Hungary, is the minister able to resolve this problem of conflict of interest by assuring the Senate? that the Prime Minister's half-ownership of this group was not a factor in any decisions to assist or to establish this joint venture. Minister, Senator Mr. Barton. Mr. Mr. President, the, the issue of uh, Dan Pork, for example, has been canvassed very fully in this place. I think three times, three times Senator Boehm got it all wrong with the allegations which his leader is not prepared to make in the House of Representatives. So Senator, Senator Boehm, of course, a failed shadow minister, has nothing to lose. Has nothing to lose. So he asks the questions up here. And the fact of the matter is, Senator, insofar as the supplementary is relevant to the Order. original question, I have answered it. Senator Walsh. Mr President, my question is addressed to the Minister for Justice. Averse though I am to enhancing lawyers' incomes at taxpayers' expense. I ask, will he guarantee that the first victim of the sexual harassment amendments enacted earlier this month will be given legal aid in order to test the issue in a real court? The Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. What have you been up to, Walter? <laughs> Mr President, I can't give any guarantees about the uh, provision of legal aid because, uh, quite uh, obviously, in general, uh, legal aid is made available through the Legal Aid Commissions, which are independent authorities, uh, uh, though funded to a large extent, I think to 55 per cent, indeed, by the Commonwealth. But they exist in the states under state law, and any application made by somebody under that uh, uh, process would, of course, be considered by the Legal Aid Commission in the state concerned. Uh, Senator, uh, insofar as uh, a right to legal aid is concerned, whilst the High Court has recently spoken in terms of, uh, of the need for a fair trial, which may require that a trial be postponed until a lawyer is provided for a person facing a serious charge, I don't think that the sort of, uh, of harassment uh, charges or, uh, or claims of unlawful activity in relation to sexual harassment, which you are speaking of, would fall into that category. Uh, nevertheless, insofar as the matter would uh, uh, come to my attention, insofar as uh, uh, a particular person offended by the application of the provision, uh, sought uh, some legal aid, we would look at the matter sympathetically, in order to ensure that uh, the validity of the Commonwealth statute was put beyond any constitutional doubt. Senator Patterson. Supplementary. Supplementary, Mr. Senator Walsh. In view of that answer, I ask the Minister, does he not regard 
the award of punitive damages of, say, thirty or forty thousand dollars by a non-court as a serious matter. Minister. Mr President, as I recall the provisions of the uh, statute, in fact, uh, that wouldn't definitively happen unless the federal court itself had uh, so uh, determined, and I believe that in that situation, in that situation uh, the challenge, as I say, being finally uh, determined within the federal court structure, then uh, I believe that a proper exercise of the judicial power of the Commonwealth would have taken place, and uh, it would not be a non-court uh, applying that particular uh, penalty. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Tate, representing the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services. I refer the Minister to the New South Wales Health Department figures, which show that waiting lists at Bankstown Hospital in the Prime Minister's electorate would double every year for the next five years because of the federal government's new Medicare deal with the states. I also refer to the fact that since 1985, federal government, of New so federal government funding of New South Wales hospital costs has declined from 40 per cent to only 31 per cent. In light of these figures and the Prime Minister's recent claim that Australians do not need to take out private health insurance, I ask how can constituents in the Prime Minister's electorate expect to get access to a hospital bed when they need it? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Cinder Tate. Mr President, quite apart from the fact that in the latter part of her question, uh, Senator Patterson did not give sufficient weight to the fact that through this Senate only a couple of nights ago, for the first time the Australian Parliament endorsed the idea of the right of Australians to choose uh, public or private hospital uh, accommodation for the treatment of their illnesses supported by private health insurance. Uh, that has been made very clear and is endorsed by this government. But as to the question of access to public hospitals and waiting lists, quite clearly what the New South Wales government ought to do is to accept the new Medicare agreement that has been put forward by uh, Mr Howe, the Federal Minister for Health. What that will do will allow, will allow Australia-wide $1.6 billion over the next uh, six years in extra expenditure to be directed into public hospital services. And in the meantime, of course, uh, some $70 million is, uh, is available to the states to enable waiting lists themselves to be specifically and directly attacked and reduced. Now, at the Perth meeting of heads of government uh, only a week or so ago, the Prime Minister untied the availability of that $70 million to any progress on the uh, resolution of the Medicare agreements. And, uh, in that way, it is available immediately to be taken up by the New South Wales ministers if he were willing to accept the proposal for uh, accepting money for, for a reduction of waiting lists. He ought to take up that offer. If he does not take it up, then the Commonwealth is quite prepared to channel the money that would otherwise go to New South Wales to reduce waiting lists direct to the hospitals concerned. And perhaps that is what we will have to do in order to ensure that uh, the reduction in waiting lists program is not held up and frustrated by the intransigence of uh, the New South Wales government in this respect. By the way, I don't expect that intransigence to last much longer, because under Fightback, $1.3 billion would be removed from the public hospital system. $1.3 billion would be removed from the public hospital system. And in that situation, of course, the strain on the public hospital system in New South Wales would be absolutely enormous. And I believe that in that situation, quite clearly, the New South Wales government will be only too anxious to sign up in order to enable the very persons with whom, uh, with whom uh, Senator Patterson expresses concern uh, so that they could get the treatment that they deserve. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr President. I direct my question to Senator Cook, Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, and I refer to the likelihood of continued levels of high unemployment and hardship amongst young people, as predicted by this report, Wanted Our Future, by the Senate Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. And also I refer to this week's prediction by the National Institute of Economic and Industry Research that unemployment will remain unacceptably high till at least the year 2010. And I ask the minister, when will the government acknowledge that there's an urgent need to both redefine the concept of work, to include such activities now are known as voluntary work, for example, and to redistribute work, uh, for example, by uh, uh, reducing hours where, pro where possible for some individual workers. And does the government also accept that to redefine work is meaningless unless all Australians are entitled to a guaranteed minimum income? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Senator Cook. <coughs> Uh, Mr President, I am invited uh, in that question to comment on a report that has just come out. Uh, clearly the, uh, the government is not in a position to immediately respond upon the tabling of a report to the contents and recommendations of that report. 
I'm advised that the minister, uh, Mr Beasley, is examining the report and will uh, make a considered response shortly. To the last part of the question in which uh, I'm asked should a fair minimum wage apply uh, in Australia, I'll come to the other parts of your question in a minute, Senator Lees. The government's answer is yes, of course it should. And uh, the award system in Australia provides, particularly in the private sector, the determination of fair minimum rates for those industry sectors by an, by an independent arbitrator. And it's the government's announced intention to uh, legislate using the external affairs power of the Constitution, the ILO Convention concerning minimum uh, wages, in order to see that the minimum rates uh, are basically protected so that uh, people uh, who may be in positions of non-award coverage can negotiate knowing that they have a, uh, a fundamental protection on minimum wages. The other questions, uh, Mr President, uh, were about the definition of work. And I take those questions to be uh, definitions for the purposes of uh, determining the uh, provision of government services or uh, supports for people who, who may be unemployed. They are questions, if I may, Mr President, I will take on notice, refer to the minister and reply as soon as possible. Senator Boswell. Mr uh, President, uh, my question is addressed to Senator Cook, representing the Minister for Primary Industry, and I refer Senator Cook to the article in the uh, Financial Times this morning, Financial Review, I should say, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, and I refer to the latest estimates from ABA that real wool prices will grow by only six cents to 551 cents between now and 1997. In light of these poor predictions for the returns for the industry, can the minister give an assurance that the wool tax rebate of 3.5 per cent will not be abolished during these hard and difficult times? Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, Senator Cook. Thank you, Mr President. I seem to have uh, attended the chamber without my normal briefing from the Department of Primary Industry and Energy. <laughs> uh, you are asking me for an assurance, uh, Senator. And uh, quite clearly, as a minister representing another minister in this place, it isn't appropriate for me to express myself on that assurance. I'll refer the question to uh, Minister Crean and reply in due course. Senator Haradine. Senator, my question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Um, uh, and uh, I refer to the devastation in Flores, Indonesia, caused by the, uh, uh, by the earthquake and subsequent tidal wage, wave, which has uh, killed some two to 3,000 people and uh, caused billions of dollars' worth of damage. Isn't it a fact that this is the worst natural disaster to occur in our region for the last 30 years uh, since uh, the Gunung Agung volcano? In view of that fact, what is the government's uh, policy in regard to urgent aid uh, for the area? And uh, as um, Australian NGOs such as ACR are very capable of making sure that aid hits the ground urgently, will the minister give consideration uh, to providing or dollar for dollar order. an amount uh, for uh, a dollar? For Order. A, dollar for Order. A, a dollar for dollar on that basis. Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, I'm not sure whether it is uh, the most serious disaster for the number of years that Senator Harradine describes, but it's certainly unquestionably a major tragedy. Latest figures from Indonesian authorities put the death toll following the earthquake in Flores at 1912, with most of these uh, deaths occurring in the Maumere area. There are some media reports indicating the death toll may well be over 2,200, and it's a matter, of, I guess, of just seeing unhappily what the final confirmed figure is. The Australian government uh, stands ready to offer such uh, further assistance as is wanted by the Indonesian government. The initial Australian assistance, valued at, as I said yesterday, some $200,000, arrived in Flores uh, uh, yesterday on two RAF aircraft. The emergency supplies provided included uh, tents, tarpaulins, plastic sheeting, large water containers, generators, antibiotics and other medications, purification tablets and so on. Um, and President Sahato has expressed appreciation for that. 
we do stand ready to respond to further emergency requests from Indonesia and to participate in rehabilitation uh, activity as requested. Uh, it is a matter really of being responsive to Indonesian requests uh, rather than really being able to do anything else just at the moment. A lot of coordination meetings are proceeding and of course there has been a very significant relief effort put into train uh, by the Indonesian authorities themselves. Uh, I heard uh, Senator Haradine's last uh, suggestion about a possible dollar-for-dollar -dollar, um, supplement to NGO funds in this area. Uh, that's an issue I will raise uh, immediately with my colleagues, uh, Mr Kerrin, the Minister for Trade and Overseas Development, uh, and the uh, Treasurer, Finance Minister, to see what it might be possible to do uh, in this respect. But I can't give an off-the-cuff response now. A brief supplement. Uh, could the minister also raise it with the Prime Minister, who had uh, given the undertaking to provide a dollar for dollar for uh, uh, appeals by local NGOs for poverty alleviation in Australia, and uh, in view of the fact that these that the NGOs, uh, the aid NGOs, uh, are able to make that money hit the ground urgently in uh, in uh, Indonesia, could we? Uh, uh, could, could the minister take that on board and ensure that uh, something is done so as to encourage donations over the Christmas period by Australians? I will minister. take that further suggestion on board, Mr President. Senator Jurek. Uh, my question is directed to the Minister of Defence, uh, Senator Ray. And I refer to the decision of the government to deploy a full battalion from the ODF to Somalia in support of the United Nations Operation Restore Hope. Could the Minister explain to the Senate what capacity Australia would have to respond to a defence emergency in our region during the period in which this battalion will be deployed in Somalia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Rowe. Mr uh, President, uh, 3rd Brigade uh, operates on the basis of rotating battalions. On this uh, basis of the 1st Battalion uh, going to Somalia, the 2nd Battalion will be on uh, a readiness alert for that period of the 17 weeks. And uh, we only ever have one uh, battalion at that readiness level. It will be at the readiness level as, as is normal. It's pointed out, I think, that uh, using the operational deployment force rather than other battalions uh, did give us a strategic requirement, though, to put a shelf life on our offer, which is, uh, as you know, 17 weeks, not from today, uh, as I think Mr Houston confused a few minutes ago in the House of Representatives, but from their deployment to Somalia. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is directed to Senator Evans, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. I ask the Minister if he can advise the Senate on the significance of the new report, Grain in China, by Professor Ross Garno and uh, Dr. Guonan Ma at the Australian National University. I further ask the Minister if it's true, as the report suggests that there could be potential for large increases of exports from Australia to China. Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans. Mr President, uh, Mr Kieran yesterday launched an order, point of order. That uh, report is listed on the notice paper on the red today to be discussed when the report is tabled and to be debated by this House. If the minister has a statement to make about, about that report, that is the time to make it. It is quite inappropriate that he does so now, and I would ask you to really rule the question out of order. Mr. President, order. it's already a report that has been publicly released a couple of days ago. It has been given to the Senate as a matter of courtesy whether or not the Senate chooses to debate the issue when the report uh, is available for debate later on is a matter for the Senate. I put it to you, Mr President, that uh, it's an extraordinary suggestion that, uh, for me to respond to a question on this is in any way out of order. No, I don't think it breaches the anticipatory rule. I'll allow the question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. I hope my time may, I ask, may I please ask your guidance on this point? The red on which that report is noted says as at the bottom with an asterisk that this report that this report is not available prior to tabling. I have asked for a copy of the report and I have been told I can't have a copy until it's tabled. Technically, order, techni technically, I'm sure this is the point that's going to be made. Technically, it's not yet on the notice paper and I've got one way to rule and I'm allowing it. 
I repeat, Mr. President, it is a report that's publicly available because it was, if not through the parliamentary process for obvious reasons, because it was launched yesterday uh, by Mr. Kerrin, and it is the latest in a long series of reports that have now been published under the auspices this year of the East Asia Analytical Unit, including reports on Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and South China. In this instance, it was written by the former Australian ambassador to China and uh, Professor Guanon Ma, the Australian National University. It's worth the attention of the Senate and the nation, as it will be worth the attention of the whole international community, because it's a path-breaking piece of analysis of China's grain economy and trade. The principal findings of the report are of major significance for Australia's export interests, not only in grain. They are as follows. China's per capita income is estimated to be between two and three times greater than official Chinese and World Bank estimates. Secondly, in the 1990s, a very big shift in China's consumption patterns is expected, involving the substitution of wheat for rice and meat for grain in diets. Again, higher demand for food and much greater competition for land, for feed and livestock than previously thought, could result in a shortfall of grain production of more than 50 million tonnes by the year 2000 or about one-third of total current world trade in grain. How much this means for imports and what opportunities it will represent for Australian exporters will depend, of course, on whether the China, Chinese leadership can be persuaded to relax the present policies of grain self-sufficiency that has begun to happen in terms of China's resource allocation. To do that would be a major contribution to China's growth, and one of the many merits of this report is that it makes a formidable case which can be put to the Chinese leadership for doing just that. In terms of the implications for Australia, as the world's largest, fourth largest rather, exporter of wheat and barley, which are two of China's main grain imports, obviously the findings are of major significance for Australia and for rural producers, particularly because of the potential size of the Chinese market which has now been identified. We're very well placed to take advantage of these emerging opportunities and we're also well placed to raise these issues internationally. Professor Garno and Professor Ma provide, as I said, a, a far-reaching strategy to deal with the self-sufficiency uh, question. They argue that a narrow window of opportunity exists to deflect China from the path of Northeast Asian agricultural protectionism. We're already pursuing these issues with Chinese leaders and senior officials. We'll continue to pursue them, and Mr. Curran will also be writing to relevant members of the incoming Clinton administration, the U.S. Uh, Congress and elsewhere to draw their attention to the significance of this report and to enable some concerted approaches on these policy issues to be made to the Chinese government. If that's not enough to satisfy Senator Bishop about the relevance and utility and importance of this report, I don't know what is. Senator Heron. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question of you, Mr. President. As joint head of the department, which paid damages of $65,000 to the other joint head of the department, are you aware? that the Workers' Compensation Board of Queensland has a maximum payout for injuries covered by workers' compensation of $71,310 for loss of both eyes and $65,000 for loss of the genital organs, $35,660, and loss of the sight of one eye, $28,520. Mr. President, I seek leave to incorporate the table of that uh, within the Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. President, would you not agree that $65,000 for injury is, is excessive for injury to an elbow? Order, order. In reply, in reply to Senator Heron, no, I am not aware of any of the issues that he just raised. Whether the amount judged or not is, is an appropriate amount is something that I am going to be referring to within a very short time when I give an answer, and I am going to be offering to give all of the documents at which these figures were uh, uh, arrived at uh, in confidence to the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill, which I, which I will explain. S um, Senator McGuire. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Has the Minister seen reports of the appointment of a senior Japanese executive to the position of both President and uh, Chief Executive Officer of Toyota Australia Limited. This follows the appointment of a US citizen to head Ford Australia. In both cases, the outgoing chief executives were, were Australians. Does the government agree with a report in today's business press that the changes at Toyota confirm a drift in recent times from Australian to foreign chief executives 
in the local car industry, and does the government have any concerns about the replacement of Australians in these very senior positions in this vitally important industry? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, Toyota has announced the appointment of Mr Tom Nakagawa as its new President and Chief Executive. He will succeed Mr Robert Johnson, who has been elevated to the position of Chairman of Toyota Australia and becomes the only non-Japanese chairman in any part of Toyota's international structure. So Mr. Toyota's appointment, uh, Mr. Johnson's appointment is a significant achievement and one uh, justified by his enormous contribution to the automotive industry in Australia. Mr. President, I look forward to meeting Mr. Nakagawa, who comes to Australia with a wealth of experience in bringing new passenger motor vehicle plants into operation, which will be very uh, useful, of course, at Altona with the new uh, Toyota plant is being built. It is true that, Mr. Uh, that Ford's uh, new president in Australia, Mr John Ogden, is an American. Let us not forget that his predecessor, Jack Nasser, an Australian, is now not only chairman of Ford Europe, but is vice president of Ford's parent company in the United States, where he holds the highest position ever achieved by an Australian in the international automotive industry. I have met Mr Ogden and he is now committed to Ford's future here in Australia. As I said earlier, the automotive industry is an international business. Increasingly, Australia is becoming more integrated into international strategies of the major car companies. That is reflected in export figures from Australia. And this means that sometimes the Australian arms of the international car makers will be headed by Australians and sometimes they will not. The commitment of the car companies to Australia is far more important than the nationality of whoever happens to be a local chief executive at any particular time. And the important factor in determining that commitment is the policy framework the government provides for the development of this industry. That is why the tariff policy, the zero tariff policy, or should I say lunacy, of the opposition's car industry policy is such a threat. The car in companies are unanimous that zero tariffs will mean zero car industry in Australia. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mr. President, earlier today at question time, Senator Short uh, uh, raised a, uh, you know, tried endeavoured to raise a spectre about uh, uh, services tax, and he asked me to uh, deny uh, that uh, any work was being done. I, I indicated that the government had given no consideration to this matter. He asked me to deny that work is being done by the Treasury, uh, the, the Treasury or the Australian Tax Office. I can now provide a categorical assurance uh, on advice from the Treasurer's Office that no work is being done by the Treasury nor the ATO on this issue. On this issue. It doesn't matter where, Senator. I'm giving Senator a categorical Tate. denial. Mr President, uh, Senator uh, yesterday Senator Sawada uh, asked me a question about the uh, uh, the uh, Ansto reactor and the inquiry, and she asked me, as part of that question, which I was not able to answer yesterday, whether the Minister for Science and Technology would release the minutes of the meeting of the Australian Science and Technology Council, at which the new high flux nuclear reactor was discussed, and prepare and release an index and guide to the documents written during that process. Senator, I have been advised by the Minister for Science and Technology that this material will be made available as requested. Mr President, on the 14th of December, uh, Senator Watson asked me a question as Minister representing the Treasurer uh, relating to taxation determinations. I seek leave to have that answer incorporated in hand. Is leave, is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Evans. President, on the 10th of December, uh, Senator Chi sought advice and supporting documentation clarifying what knowledge Austrade and the ambassador in Copenhagen had concerning a proposal by a Danish company for the major piggery investment in Australia that's been exercising the opposition. I now uh, table those documents together with an index and guide to them as requested by Senator Chi. As the index uh, notes, Mr President, in the documents I'm tabling, Five of the 76 documents in question have been withheld in whole or in part on commercial and confidence grounds. I have, however, acceded to a request that I received from Senator Hill's office that he be able to view those documents on a confidential basis. In tabling the documents, I'd like to point out that they show clearly that the series of allegations made by Senator O'Chee 
based on his extrapolations of the contents of the Austrade memo of 22 November 1990, are all entirely unfounded and indeed erroneous. These documents clearly show government agencies going about the work that they're supposed to do in creating trade and commercial opportunities for Australia. There's no impropriety here, nor any suggestion that the connections that the opposition is seeking to draw between Austrade and the Prime Minister's piggery interests exist. Throughout the uh, life of the project, 1989-92, Austrade offered its investment facilitation services where appropriate. This involved monitoring the project in Denmark and in Australia. Austrade worked to optimise the chances of the project, which represented an important investment for Australia, which promised to generate substantial export income. It was also a project which was enthusiastically supported by the domestic industry and by various state governments who were seeking to have the investment located in their state. The documents clearly show that Austrade worked to facilitate the investment but did not at any stage give any assurance regarding its Austrade's capacity to resolve the quarantine issue. This was clearly left in the hands of the Australian Quarantine Inspection Service. The documents also show that, contrary to Senator O'Chee's suggestion, Austrade did not receive any application from the Danish company seeking quarantine clearance for the import of pigs or genetic material. The reports by Mr Landos of Aquis that Austrade and the Ambassador to Copenhagen, Mr Benson, knew details of the project in September 1990 and detailed these to him during his meeting with them in Copenhagen during that month are borne out by these documents. Their knowledge of the project was perfectly natural given this background of domestic interest and appears in Austrade reports back to Canberra in May and June 1990. As I previously advised the, uh, the Senate on 10 September, the Austrade memo of 22 November which report, 1990, which reported advice from the Danish company that, and I quote, all technical, principally quarantine, issues are resolved, unquote, was simply that a report of advice that he had received. The documents also show that when this report was received in Canberra, Austrade sought to clarify this point and was advised that Aquis had told DPIE the protocols had not been signed because, in fact, they had not been developed. DPIE felt that the Danish company was presenting an optimistic gloss for the benefit of potential investors. This was accepted by Austrade. It's also been suggested, finally, Mr. President, by Senator O'Chee, that Austrade was acting in the belief that the potential Australian investor involved the Prime Minister's company. These documents clearly show that neither Austrade nor the Ambassador in Copenhagen knew of any such involvement until it became public knowledge earlier this year. So, Mr. President, this squalid little exercise by Senator O'Chee has proved manifestly ill-founded. I table the documents accordingly. Mr. President, while I'm on my feet, sorry, Senator Bishop um, asked me uh, yesterday about uh, details of Mr. Boucher's uh, appointment. I asked her to put that note, question on notice. She has not done so. I did, however, have drawn to my attention uh, yesterday by Senator Bishop that she had asked some questions about uh, this issue back on the 3rd of November, which I had undertook to reply to when documents became available. Lest she further mislead the Senate or anybody else about the status of this matter, let me say, by way of uh, answer to her question yesterday, that I have now checked uh, what I undertook to do on the 3rd of November. I undertook, first of all, to table the document about the terms and conditions of Mr Borthwick's appointment. I did so the following day. As to, as to Mr. Well, you've had your figures subsequently. There's no. Well, you'll get your figures then, if that's what you're still yelping about. You can have them. There's no mystery oh, about it. They're on the. Pub, they're a matter of uh, public legitimate interest, and they'll go on the public record if they haven't been oh, to your are. satisfaction. Well, if you know them, okay. Well, I won't. I won't bother then to table if you know already what it's about. Okay. As to, uh, as to Mr Boucher's, I did not undertake to, uh, to advise you or to table documents about the date of his appointment by the Executive Council, but I am now, out of the goodness of my heart, willing to tell you that he was formally appointed by the Executive Council on 23 November 1992. I did undertake to tell you about the terms and conditions of his appointment by way of tabling the relevant document when that document was, uh, was finalised and the terms and conditions were determined. Uh, I'm able to tell you now that that document has not yet uh, been prepared, uh, nor is it expected to be for some time. Normally, terms and conditions documents for a departing head of mission are settled only quite are settled just before the the uh, member in question uh, departs. That's the normal practice, and that was the practice that will be followed uh, again on this occasion. Uh, and he. Uh, hmm? 
in the sense that uh, Mr Boucher doesn't take up the position in March, I don't expect it will be till sometime early in the new year that the matter is addressed, in particular when Mr Boucher returns from his present sick leave and is able to address this and other matters. May I say, however, lest there be any—I'm told he's on sick leave at the moment. Well, is that giving you some joy, is it, uh, Senator Bishop? There Order. has, however, may I say, uh, Mr President, there's been no suggestion of which I or my department uh, are aware that Mr Boucher will be treated on anything other than absolutely a standard basis, so far as this appointment is concerned. In particular, there's no suggestion uh, that he be paid at other than his uh, present substantive rate of remuneration, which is the normal basis on which these ambassadorial appointments are made. So again, Mr. President, that's not enough to shut Senator Bishop up and satisfy her about the good faith with which I order. respond to her inquiries. Then uh, or, that's order. her bad luck. Senator Evans might order. be appropriate in certain forums with the Liberal, uh, Labor Party, but certainly not in the Senate. And I ask we withdraw that. Yeah, that's why he can't language. Oh. Yes. Look, look. If, uh, if Senator Evans will withdraw, it might improve the, uh, the, the debate. The words shut up. But I, I, look, I've got to point out. I'm sorry. That wasn't I'm not going to go through the words. I wrote down a question time that I regard as unparliamentary, but there were plenty. If it's the way I, I'm sorry. No, it's the way I said it. Well, you're probably right. It was. There was there was malice in my heart, if not in my expression. So under those circumstances, I do withdraw. Senator Cook. About the CES. Uh, I wonder if I can have the answer incorporated in Hansard rather than read it. Is Luke granted? It, it establishes that there's no content to the question raised by Senator Brownhill. And earlier this week, I was asked a question by Senator Perra. I wonder if I can ask the same <laughs> indulgence of the Senate. Uh, both these questions were uh, in my capacity as Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Is Luke granted? Luke granted. Ministerial. Yes. Senator Tate. Mr. President. Uh, some time ago, Senator Knowles asked me a question about Med Network Systems Proprietary Limited. I have provided the Honourable Senator with a copy of the answer. I seek leave to incorporate it and hand so. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Unanswered question. These are unanswered questions from yesterday, and that's why I'm taking this position. Um, late yesterday, following a statement by me in response to the question raised by Senator Hill earlier in the day, I made a statement to the Senate. Uh, in discussion on my statement, further questions were put to me by Senators Hill and Crane. As I advised the Senate at the time, I've obtained further, I have obtained further information from Mr Speaker and the Joint House Department. There's quite a number of detailed questions were asked, and I was going to, to table a list of them because it comes to five pages, but I believe Senator Hill wants them uh, read out. So uh, I, I, I propose to do that. Uh, I became aware of the accident and meeting with the Speaker a couple of days after the event. At that time, advised me he was considering taking legal action. I did not become involved in the process, nor would it be appropriate for me to do so. And I must say to Senator Heron, I'll have a look at the hand but if you implied that I had some input into the amount paid to the Speaker, I reject that absolutely. F uh, furthermore, the Speaker advised me that he was keeping himself at arm's length from the matter. I leave it to the judgment of the head of the department, for which I am either singly or jointly responsible, to seek my assistance or decision if that is required. The Secretary of the Joint House Department did not seek my intervention in this matter and has assured me that neither he nor his officers discussed this matter with the Speaker. One of the questions raised by Senator Hill is contained in the following questions, and I will mention at this stage. Will the Department make available the legal opinions upon which the assessment of damages and liability was made? Oral advice from the Australian Government Solicitor's Office is that this information is covered by legal professional privilege and to release it could provide possible litigants with information, prop with information properly the property of the defendant and their solicitors. Nevertheless, I have offered to provide Senator Hill on a confidential basis with copies of the legal advisings to satisfy himself that proper process was followed. Order. I'm going to go through the questions and answer now. The accident occurred, out question. The accident occurred outside the parliamentary precinct. I'm going to ask you whether that is correct. Yes, the accident occurred in the Canberra suburb of Hughes. Question, was it an exercise bike? No, the bike was not an exercise bike. It was a Strider fold-up bike which was purchased to be used by members, senators, their spouses and children, staff of the parliament for recreational riding. Was the bike assembled outside the building? It was delivered in fold-up form to the speaker and unfolded by him. What was the basis of the claim? Uh, these are questions. Why was faulty equipment being used by the speaker outside the precincts of parliament? 
we would very much like to know the nature of the fault in the equipment. The fault was at the frame of the bike collapse when the speaker rode over a pothole. The issue of the Commonwealth being negligent arose. The issue of the Commonwealth being negligent arose because the Joint House Department officers were considered by the barrister engaged by the Australian government solicitor not to have exercised their duty of care. The barrister believed the Joint House staff had possession of a manual on the bike and information from safety officials in the ACT, which was not passed on to the users. The manual stated, do not ride over curbs or through deep potholes, and the maximum load for the bike is 100 kilos. Of course, the speaker's weight was thought by the Joint House to be in excess of 100 kilos. This information, any other instructions, should have been brought to the speaker's attention. The department should also have advised that care should be taken in riding the bikes because of their method of construction and different centre of gravity from ordinary bikes. Who authorised the payment? After receiving a recommendation from the Australian Government Solicitor, the Secretary of the Joint House Department accepted the recommendation and authorised a settlement for the amount recommended, i.e. $65,000. Question. I thought that an accident which involved parliamentary equipment would have been brought to the attention of the Joint House Committee. Following the, answer, following the accident, four Strider bikes were initially purchased. The equipment was removed from use. This action was taken by the Department prior to legal action being commenced. Equipment failures or breakdown are not normally brought to the attention of the Committee. Legal matters go to the administrative functioning of the Department and are not matters for the Committee whose role is to advise the presiding officers on the provision of services and facilities to members of Parliament. Why did the Joint House Department annual report not state that it was the head of the department, the speaker, who was paid the damages. It is not the practice to identify the recipient of personal injury claims for privacy reasons, but the department identified the quantum of each claim settled in the 1991-92 in its annual report for accountability purposes. What was the injury for which damages were paid? The speaker suffered injuries to both hands, his right elbow and face. The statement of claim related to the injury states fracture of the right radial head, severe right ulnar nerve entrapment, and chronic ulnar nerve compression requiring surgery, development of myos myositis ossificans of the elbow, bruising, lacerations and abrasion shock. What medical advice was given? What was the assessment? This was personal medical information which was provided to the Commonwealth's legal advisers. It is not appropriate for privacy reasons to publicly disclose this information which they assessed and took into account when recommending a settlement figure. Question. What was the legal advice that the department heads received? The presiding officers in their capacity as heads of the Joint House Department neither sought nor received any access to the Commonwealth legal advice. This was an administrative matter handled by the Secretary of the Joint House Department. Question. The question of contributory negligence has not been addressed. This was not an issue in this case. Details of the contract of hire. No formal contract exists. The use of health and recreation facilities by members, senators, members and staff who do not pay an annual membership fee includes a hiring fee of $2 per use. The Speaker was not a member of the facilities and paid the hire fee. Who made the decision that the Australian Government Solicitor Act for the Department? In the normal course of events, the Joint House Department seeks advice from the Australian Government Solicitor on damages claims. In this case, the Secretary of the Department thought it doubly prudent because the Speaker had made the claim that the matter be handed over to the Australian Government Solicitor to ensure probity in the handling of the matter. Question. I should also like to know why the settlement was paid by the Department of Finance and not by the Joint House Department. The Secretary of the Joint House Department has corrected earlier advice, which he inadvertently provided to the Speaker and the President. A form authorising payment based on advice and instructions from the Australian Government Solicitor was forwarded to the Department of Finance, who issued a cheque on behalf of the Commonwealth and debited the Joint House Department Contingency Fund, which provides funds to pay for claims and damages. Questions asked by Senator Crane. How much was the total claim? Was it fully paid? Answer. The settlement negotiated by the Australian Government Solicitor was for $51,205.55 damages plus $3,794.45 medical expenses plus $10,000 legal expenses, total $65,000. Was court litigation involved or was it settled out of court? After negotiations lasting 12 months, the matter was settled out of court in November 1991 after the writ of summons had been issued in the ACT Supreme Court, but before proceeding to hearing. Question. What were the legal expenses incurred by the Speaker? After examination of the Speaker's solicitor's claims for costs, the Australian Government solicitor endorsed a claim for $10,000. Were they met by the Commonwealth? Yes, they were included in the $65,000 settlement. 
Question, were there any other legal costs involved in the matter which were met by the Commonwealth? Answer, the Commonwealth met its own legal costs. The Australian Government solicitor, as was the practice in 1991, did not charge the Joint House Department for its own costs. The Australian Government solicitor engaged a barrister and passed the cost of $500 onto the Joint House Department. To assist in the consideration of issues arising in the case, the Joint House Department obtained expert technical advice on the bikes at a cost of approximately $800. Senator Hill. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion to take note of, the, of your statement. Is leave granted? Hmm? Well, answer or state. We'll Is leave granted? We'll... Oh, I see. Leave granted. St statement. Um, Mr. Mr. President, uh, um, what you put before the Senate is, is extraordinary and ra again raises many questions in itself. But uh, there's, only one, uh, there's only one issue that I, I want to, uh, to raise uh, and to put to you in the light of what you have said. Um, it seems that what you have said is that, the, that the, uh, the fault of the Commonwealth was not to advise was not to advise the Speaker that there was a weight, uh, effective weight limit on the use of these, uh, these bicycles. Uh, I understand that a woman from the health centre was on duty when the Speaker, Mr Maclay, came in to hire the bike, and she refused to let him have the bike because he was more than 100 uh, kilograms in weight. I am further advised that uh, the Speaker later, undeterred, went back to the health centre during the lunch break so he could hire the bicycle from another person who was unaware of the weight limit. I am told that the woman involved in the matter, the one who, who made the first, gave the first advice to Mr Maclay that it wasn't a bike suitable for him to use, gave a statement of the incident to the lawyers concerned. And I ask you, therefore, are you aware of that statement? And when, now that you have been through the file in detail, can you tell the Senate whether there is such a statement on the file? No, I, I cannot do that because I haven't been through the file in detail at all. Not, a, not at all. This, these quest, the, this, the, the, the questions and the answers were prepared by the head of the Joint House Department and the Speaker, and I will, I will get you an answer for this. I said it was a matter that I had. I, there was an issue raised by Senator Hill. And I will get an answer to it. Senator, Senator Austin. Um, Mr President, I would have thought that uh, the matter raised by Senator Hill was uh, of the utmost seriousness. It may even be uh, a sufficient defence to preclude any payment. And in those circumstances, uh, I would ask you to uh, very urgently consider what material ought to be made available publicly. For example, to uh, say to us that um, certain documents attract legal professional privilege, and one I think you said which was claimed by the defendants, uh, is certainly not uh, the usual understanding of the term. It's a privilege normally claimed by the plaintiff. But in any event, I would have thought that both parties could waive that privilege. In other words, in the interest of the public, and given that we are talking about public monies, both parties ought to be prepared to make all relevant documents available, including the documentary evidence in support of the claim and the medical reports. Certainly uh, from the, the scant nature of the injuries as described by you, and I would have thought you'd have been in a position to have at least tabled the, the writ, which is clearly a public document having been issued out of the Supreme Court. On the basis of that evidence, it is very hard indeed to see uh, the basis of the claim. For example, did it contain a claim for future economic loss, for any loss of earnings uh, or any other pecuniary loss? And uh, If not, is that all meant to constitute uh, pain and suffering loss of enjoyment of life, which is a very nebulous concept, one which Senator Kearney would well know because he used to make these sorts of outrageous claims on a regular basis, uh, need to be very carefully and independently assessed on the basis of expert evidence. And, uh, we would want to know uh, whether there was an independent investigator's report into the circumstances of the injury. Uh, for example, I note you say that the bike was assembled by the Speaker. Now, it may well be that he did not uh, assemble it as he ought to have done. He may not have done up the nuts as tightly as they should have been done up. 
And in those circumstances, it seems extraordinary that you can say that contributory negligence was not relevant. Indeed, uh, the onus of proof being on him, I would have thought that there were, there were considerable difficulties confronting any plaintiff in these circumstances to show that somehow it was the fault of uh, those who didn't bring certain matters to his attention. He ought to appreciate, uh, presumably, what uh, can and can't be done in riding a bike of this sort. He ought to test it before he gets on board and uh, he generally ought to take account of his own uh, physical condition. But more importantly, it is absolutely impossible for anyone to make a judgment about the ultimate merits of the action without looking at all the relevant documentation. But can I say, uh, as an outsider, that it seems an extraordinarily high payout, certainly uh, one that I'd be amazed you could recover in uh, the normal course of negotiations for a, an injury such as this. We don't know, for example, whether uh, the injuries had substantially resolved, whether there's any permanent disability. Uh, Senator Heron, no doubt, is in a much better position to comment on this than others. But if we're talking about severe ulnar nerve entrapment. I would have thought. That's simply a matter of an operation to uh, clear the entrapment, and uh, it doesn't necessarily follow there'd be any residual damage. And uh, therefore, to merely say that uh, there was some damage to uh, the right, a fracture of the right radial nerve doesn't tell you a thing. Was it an undisplaced fracture? If so, uh, was there any continuing uh, injury? Uh, unless you know those matters, then of course there's no basis for suggesting that it's a serious claim. And uh, a figure of uh, $65,000 or $50,000 on the face of it for pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, as Senator Cooney would well know, is something that you'd normally uh, be looking at if you were permanently and severely disabled. Now, none of us know the extent to which Mr. McClay is disabled other than in his conduct of proceedings in the uh, House of Representatives, but presumably he doesn't need an elbow or a wrist. To, in, to enforce order, 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 even if you were so minded. Order, time's up. Um, Senator, Senator Ray. Mr. President, on this particular matter, again, the Senate setting itself up as a jury. But I think, no, no. Well, let's, let's. Uh, you, Senator Orson, have made comments about and an analysis about the medical circumstances of Mr. McClay's injury. You've said it here, and you've done it here. Where, where, there are two, where there are two issues to be determined here. Two issues to be determined here. One, whether the correct process in all this uh, thing was followed and uh, Mr. President's role in that. And secondly, having gone through those processes and established whether they're right or wrong, was there an appropriate outcome? I think they're the two questions raised by all of this. And. Uh, in terms of the role of the president, I think he's behaved quite properly. He hasn't. Uh, you see, this is why we can't take this seriously, Mr. That's president. Right. We have all the snide comments right. from Senator Olson and Senator Patterson and all the rest, who would open their remarks here and say this is a serious matter, and then just sit here making snide interjections about the matter, about the matter that has no relevance to the matter. Well, uh, well, the jury, the jury over here has brought in the verdict. But I'm going back to the question of process. What would be the appropriate processes in this particular matter? I think the first, uh, I think the first uh, process is: Does Mr. McClay retain rights that everyone else in this building has, or is he excluded from that? And I think the answer has to be: Of course, he retains those rights. And maybe this debate would not be occurring if it had been some other person in the building that went through the same circumstances. So we agree on one thing, I think, across this chamber, that he retains his rights. Secondly, though, he is in a different position from everyone else in this building. We also acknowledge that. That he is one of the uh, another snide remark from Senator Knowles. Why don't you treat this issue seriously? Well just be quiet and make your contribution. Order. Later. Now, Mr. President, we've established the fact, we've established the fact that Mr. McClay has the same right as anyone else in the building, but he is not in the same position. He holds, a, he holds an office in this building that would mean the handling of any such matter would be far more sensitive and complicated for than the average person in this building. I think that's the second thing to be conceded. Therefore, 
when Mr Maclay wishes to proceed with a claim for compensation, how should it be best dealt with? Well, certainly not by himself, certainly not by, uh, certainly not by uh, Mr President, and I think that the uh, Joint House Department was quite correct to refer this to the government solicitor. And I think it was quite correct that the adjudication on this was made at that level with the president and speaker at hand's length, having no involvement in it whatsoever. Supposing he had been told he was too good for the bar. No, no, no. I know someone with your concentration span, Senator Walters, would not Order. yet realise. Order. She said it last night. She said I must order. be a fool. Yeah, order. Order. It should be with yeah. well, I am talking about the process, not the result of the adjudication yet, Senator Walters. Trying to establish the case that the proper processes were gone through. The third matter, of which I don't have enough knowledge to comment on, is whether it's a fair figure, whether they considered everything, all the rest of it. And uh, I do support the fact that at the initial stage, Mr President should release that information to Senator Hill. He will then be in a position to say there is no cover-up, or if he thinks there is a cover-up, to pursue that third and critical issue. But I must say Mr Maclay retains his rights. He retains his rights. He is in a more special position from others, which can hurt his rights. The proper processes went through. Whether the result is right or wrong, that is another debate to be had, maybe today, maybe now, etc. But I wanted to establish those other processes, and Mr. President, I believed acted within the highest propriety of this chamber. Senator Heron. Mr. President, I agree with Senator Ray. There are two aspects that need to be covered here. One is the process. Mr. President, I find it absolutely extraordinary that you can wash your hands of this thing. You are the joint head of, this de of the department, and you cannot say that the secretary it was handled at secretarial level. You are the joint head of the department. Now, if you were not informed and you did not have a hand in it, and I accept that assurance, if you were not, it is derelict of the secretary not to inform you as joint head of the department. That's the Nuremberg defence. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going on. Mr. President, you don't have that right. You are joint head of the department. So what Senator Ray said was absolutely correct. There is a, there is a matter of process. And within that process, you are responsible, Mr. President, with the joint head. And you are responsible for the expenditure of taxpayers' money. And you cannot wash your hands of this matter. And the second point that I wish to raise is the appropriateness, as Senator Ray said. And I would like to read to you with each, from each state what happens in, re, in compensation to the dependent spouse of somebody who is killed in an accident. In my own state, it's $77,470 a lump sum goes to the dependent spouse after death by accident. In Victoria, it's $108,640,000. In New South Wales, it's $150,000. In South Australia, it's $80,000 lump sum and 50 per cent of the deceased's average weekly earnings. In Western Australia, it's $83,376 lump sum. In the Northern Territory, 80,449,000 lump sum. Mr President, that's in, in death, and that goes to the dependent. And here we have $65,000 to an injury to an elbow where, and I can assure you from a medical point of view, a displaced fracture of the head of the radius with entrapment of the, of the nerve and myositis ossificans, which is in, that, that is just a bit of calcification in the bruise around it. As, as uh, Senator Olson said, it is a not uncommon occurrence in that sort of injury. It is remedied by a simple operation to pull the nerve out, and at the most it will give you 10 per cent disability. I'd like, to, I'd like to know how much disability occurred in this place. That hasn't been answered. But $65,000, Senator Collins, $65,000 for an, an injury of this nature is absolutely exorbitant. It has no relation to the injury uh, concerned. And I believe that there should be expert advice sought on that matter. So there are two, two aspects, Mr. President, as Senator Ray quite rightly said. There is the process, and you're, you're attempting to take no responsibility for the expenditure of this sum, this sum of taxpayers' funds, and the second aspect of the appropriateness of the, of the sum that was, that was given. Senator Kearney. Kearney. But, uh, I think uh, what Senator 
uh, Ray has said is happening here, that we're becoming a jury. And I'm a man who has great respect, may I say, for Senator Heron, but he has made judgments and he's made, uh, uh, made uh, statements on the basis of facts with which he is not equipped. And uh, well, no, you haven't. Uh, you haven't, Senator Heron. If you, if you were in this, this is a matter which is very much to do with the assessment of compensation in the court. There is a, uh, there is a process that has to be gone through. Senator Alston knows this. I thought his uh, address was a, uh, quite a brilliant defendant's address. But I still would have, uh, I still would have thought that uh, I would have got the money uh, nonetheless. Senator, uh, Senator Heron, can I say that Senator Heron has read out figures about uh, the death, uh, the, 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 the figures that indicate the compensation a widow would get for the death uh, of a husband. I think you'd probably find that was under a compensation system, uh, uh, Senator Heron. As I understand uh, what has been done here, this is a common law action, as Senator Alston will tell you. It's quite a different issue. The fact of the matter is that if there is a common law action, uh, uh, widows get a lot more if it's, uh, if it's justified than the figures you have quoted. And I think uh, not that you would have intended this, but the quoting of those figures has been quite an unfair uh, uh, reflection on what is a common law action. We've got to decide uh, in this uh, chamber whether or not we want to go in to the exercise of deciding whether or not we are going to decide uh, what is a fair figure or uh, otherwise. What I say is this, Senator Alston, that we can, I think, quite properly look at the process as to whether or not the amount, uh, the, not, not the amount, but the way that amount was assessed in terms of who did it, whether the proper people did it, whether the proper process was gone through, whether that was done, that's something we can look at. That's the issue that, Senator, uh, that the President has dealt with. The President should have kept quite clear of this. It would be wrong for somebody who knows uh, uh, I think uh, Senator Maclay on the uh, uh, Mr. Maclay on the basis that um, uh, that the president does to assess it. He has stayed uh, clear of that. What we can do, I think, and there's, there's no uh, problem about this. I think it's, we're entitled to look at uh, whether or not the uh, proper people, of, in, in terms of the sorts of people who assess this, were quite uh, were, were the proper people. Uh, as I understand it, there was a barrister who did it. Uh, <coughs> I take him to be a barrister competent in this field. The Australian public solicitor looked at the issue. Is that the proper body to do it? They are the sorts of issues that we can look at, but I think it's wrong for us to be going about whether or not the figure was fair on the basis of the evidence that has been given to us, because we're not in possession of all the evidence. The only, the only other thing I would like to say is this. that. The, the fact that it's taxpayers' money, that is, it's money from the consolidated revenue that goes to the uh, uh, president, shouldn't uh, uh, be a uh, factor which leads us to go into uh, uh, the issue of whether or not a fair figure has been assessed on the evidence. That's a uh, taxpayers' funds are paid uh, again and again to people who have been injured as a result of the Commonwealth's negligence. So I simply say this: let's get round to the real issue. Which is whether or not, as Senator Hill, I think Senator Hill has said this on AM this morning. He said it now. Let's look at the process. If the process is right, then uh, let it uh, go at that. But it's wrong, I think, to go into uh, what is really the exercise for a jury otherwise. So I would suggest that we uh, go on the line that Senator Hill has suggested. Senator Crichton Brown. Might I say, with respect, that while it's only become apparent today, notwithstanding statements put out by Mr. McClay yesterday, that the decision, the decision, the final decision to settle at $65,000 was made by Mr. McClay's subordinate, was made by Mike Bolton, head of the department. Now, I do not reflect, nor would I reflect on Mike, to Michael Bolton. The truth of the matter is, Mr. McClay is his boss, and boss he is. If anybody who's been on the Joint House, Joint House Committee will know how much he is his boss. And it's an intolerable situation for Mr. McClay to have to sit in judgment. On what negotiation should take place, Mr. Bolton? Mr. Bolton. Mr. Bolton. Yes, absolutely. Uh, knowing, knowing that he was still, he's still in the employ of Mr. McClay. Now, at the very least, with respect, Mr. President, I would have thought that Mr. Bolton, so as to remove himself from the personal relationship, should have referred the matter to the Joint House Committee, which is made up of every political party in the Parliament. It is that we're always reminded by Mr. McClay, but an advisory body, an advisory committee. I can think of no better occasion 
than for that advice to be sought. I note, Mr. President, that you observed that um, that committee is only responsible for offering advice in respect of services and facilities and amenities for members and senators. I would have thought the provision of a bicycle would have fitted perfectly, perfectly into, that, uh, into that category. The, 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 other, the other things I'd say, Mr. President, which I, yeah, particularly if the bike defective. The other thing, I, the other things I'd say, Mr. President, I noticed in today's Canberra Times, the standard comment when information is being backgrounded to a journalist that says, "It is understood that Mr. McClay had been taking the bike, a collapsible model, on a trial run near Parliament House as part of a mooted program of politicians using bikes for commuting." <laughs> Pardon? It is understood that Mr McClay had been taking the bike, a collapsible model, for a trial run near Parliament House as part of a mooted program of politicians using such bikes for commuting. I must say it's a well-hidden well hid secret, that program. But when he had bumped against a curb, the bike had collapsed beneath him. Well, of course, that's, now, I'm not suggesting that, that that information came from Mr McClay, but I rather wonder who else would have that information to provide it to the journalist in the Canberra Times. I, 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 note, I, I note the dedication of the service of Mr Maclay that he was in fact undertaking this, this, um, this uh, project on behalf of all of us on Anzac Day, on a, on a public holiday, and, and for the generous contribution that his family made also because I understand his son was also undertaking this pilot, pilot project. Mr, 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 Mr President, Senator Ray is quite right when he says that Mr Maclay doesn't abrogate any of his rights simply because he takes on the responsibilities of the speaker any more than you do, any more than any of us do when we assume any responsibilities. But when he's elevated to such a position, he's required to balance his rights with his responsibilities. He is not simply an ordinary employee who, who, who has injured himself as, as a result of the conduct of his employee, employer. I don't make any judgments as to whether the facts as presented uh, by uh, Senator Hill as a question are right or not. But I would have thought, by any measure, the ordinary average intelligent person in taking a dismantled piece of equipment, unless they've got some particular skills, would have asked for the instructions. And I'm certain that any responsible officer of the parliament, if they were told that their particular model didn't fit the bike. Time, time's expired. Wouldn't have continued to have asked for the bike. Senator McMullen. As Mr. President, I had no intention of entering this debate because I thought that the position had been adequately presented by Senator Ray and Senator Cooney. But there's one additional point that I wish to add to this debate, because we have checked one fact that has been raised that was new, was not contained in your uh, response, and was not an allegation hadn't been heard by anyone on this side. And I want to say for the record that the Speaker, Mr Maclay, absolutely and categorically denies the allegation that he had previously been advised by anybody that he should, uh, that he was not, that he should not take the bike and that it was not suitable for him. He, he, even, he denies that he even went down to the uh, health centre to get the bike. The bike was delivered to his office and, there, and his advice to us is unequivocal that no such advice was ever offered. So I think it's important that, and it's one of the problems that arises, one of the problems, well, can I just say to you that what you have just, your fanatical attempt to put something on the record that will d damage uh, the speaker is one of the very good reasons why the argument that was put by Senator Ray and Senator Cooney that it is entirely inappropriate for people here to be rising and purporting to make quasi-judicial determinations about the nature of the determination, the decisions that have been made by the, common, by the Australian government solicitor in this matter. And remember, we had a lot of comment about how a lot of comment, probably because we knew what people like you would leap into the gutter about with it as soon as it was became available, and every such fear has been proved 100 per cent plus. Now, the fact of the matter is simply this. 
The fact of the, no, no, I understand the question and the response, and I enjoyed it absolutely. The fact of the matter is simply this. No, no, it, was just news to, it came as news to me when it was announced, but I enjoyed the opportunity to make that response, and I enjoyed it. No, no. Compounding ignorance with misleading is not helpful. Order. Order. The, uh, this is a great example all of this is why a lot of students would never stay out of politics. I think this is the chamber is absolutely in grave danger of significantly abusing its responsibilities with regard to this matter on a day when a lot of people are going to very soon be getting up and expressing serious concern about how late we're sitting and how much business there is. And look at all, and then we'll have the rural members getting up and saying, "Why are you dealing with the rural issues so late at night?" It shows the government doesn't care about it. I can hear all the speeches now. I think we might even hear one from Senator Heron. And yet here he is getting up, prete pretending to be contributing in a serious, professional manner to what is merely another heap of rubbish on the smear trail. Now, let us. The only reason I got up to participate in this debate, although I've enjoyed the opportunity, is to say that the way that that further allegation was dragged across the trail without checking, ignorance is no excuse for you, Senator Knowles. The Order. fact of the matter is Order. that no, no, not in the slightest. And it is absolutely clear that the speaker categorically denies that, and it's important we put it on the record before the deliberate misleading or the accidental misleading I'm sorry, I don't think it was deliberate the accidental misleading could have been compounded by people Order. taking it up and pursuing it Order. further. Time's expired. Senator Crane. Thank you, um, Mr uh, President. Was this a point of order? Or? Uh, well, pursuant to uh, standing order 191, I wish to uh, explain some material part of my speech which has been misquoted or misunderstood. And I think it is a very important matter arising. Sorry? Oh, yes, you do. Arising. No, no. Well, I've, I've written down what you said. Well, yes, yes you, you've got the right to, to make a speech now. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what Senator awesome. McMullen said, Dean, referring to me, was that. Uh, I had been making fanatical efforts to put something on the record that would damage the speaker, and that is that is a clear that. All right. Well, I mean, you're you're compounding the allegation, and that's why I wanted to, to clarify the position. Well, I just want to explain this. Uh, what we are saying on our. Well, yes, Senator Rowe. Senator Rawson has used one part of the standing orders to make an explanation, where in fact. The intervention by Senator McMullen was to his interjection. There's nothing in standing orders that allows Senator Olson to get up and explain his interjection or someone's response to it. Out of order, Mr. President, uh, nothing was said by Senator McMullen using those words to suggest that he was only referring to an interjection on my part. He made the broad statement, which clearly is taken to refer to my speech, and I therefore seek to. Respond order. To it. Look, I think Senator Ray is technically right, but I, I find it very difficult to remember every single thing that was said, and that's the problem that I've got. Well, Mr. Can I, before uh, dealing with this man, with uh, Senator Alston's uh, right to speak on this matter, speak to the point of order? Because yes. it is, it was, un, there was no doubt in the circumstances that I referred to a further question which Senator Alston sought to drag across the trail by way of interjection. Not the slightest doubt at all. If he wishes leave to explain why he made that interjection, we will give it. That is the only matter to which I was referring and therefore the only matter to which properly he might respond now. But if he wants leave to explain why he made that interjection, yeah. we'll give it to him. Look, look, I'm not in the position of remembering whether it was an interjection or whether it was part of his speech. I think it might be in the circumstances. It might be better if your contribution is very brief, Senator Alston. Thank you, Mr. President. I simply want to say this: we are not seeking to prejudge anything. What we seek is for all the all right, just a moment, for all the relevant material to be put on the record, including material that will go to the point made by the the matter raised by Senator Hill. Now, it is Im it is impossible for anyone to make a sensible judgment, not just on the process, but on the merits of the argument. And I, I say again, 
$50,000 for general damages on the face of it suggests a very, very generous award. We don't want to say that it was, uh, certain, was not something that could ever be uh, uh, given to someone by way of settlement. We simply say that, faced with what appears to be a very high offer, or not, yes, offer, then uh, you ought to provide the material to substantiate it and to justify it. And that includes the material that would refute the matter that Senator Hill raised. In other words, Senator Hill suggested there was a statement made by this woman to that effect, that there had been a complaint and that indeed the Speaker went and uh, saw someone else who was unaware of it. In those circumstances, uh, I would ask that uh, you, Mr President, uh, go through the file and uh, make this material available by way of tabling so that proper and sensible judgments can be made about the merits of the claim. Um, Senator Ray, well, just by you? leave, if I may comment on Senator Orson for one minute. I mean, well, you have asked questions here. Time is just about to expire. You have asked Ray. questions of uh, the President at this stage, uh, Senator Orson, about these matters. I don't believe you should get an immediate response from the. Don't believe you should get immediate response from the President. And uh, the president can go away and think about the points you've made. Order. The time for the debate has expired. Could I, could I just say, I have no details of the court case whatsoever. But the legal opinions upon which the assessment of damages and liability was made have been delivered to my office. I haven't even had time to look at them. But I'll, before I look at them, because I now have another meeting, I'll give them to Senator Hill's office immediately. Immediately. The question. Yes. The question. The question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGiven. Mr. President, pursuant to contingent Brian. notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely the moving of a motion of censure against Senator Collins. Order, Mr. President. I'm not trying to interrupt you in any way, Senator. Uh, no, but I think uh, uh, no one was given an opportunity to announce to note answers. Uh, we went straight into a noting of the President's statement. As, well, we were told well, if it's going to be interpreted that way, I'm del deliriously happy. Yeah. Senator McGibbon. And I move that a motion to censure be moved forthwith and have precedence over all other business until determined. The, yeah. This motion will go through whatever procedure well, the resolution is, the needs to be put is the to standing, allow the motion to be put. The question is the standing orders be suspended. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGuinness. Mr President, I move that a motion of censure be moved forthwith. And uh, that motion will be that this Senate censures the Minister for Transport and Communications for his persistent failure to immediately investigate allegations of irregularities concerning the CAA TATS contract and his inordinate delay in establishing the McPhee inquiry. Mr Deputy President, this is the most serious charge. It's a question of putting the motion on the procedural motion. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Mr Deputy you can President. You now move your sanction motion. Mr Deputy President, I move that the Senate censures the Minister for Transport and Communications for his persistent failure to immediately investigate allegations of irregularities concerning the CAA TATS contract and his inordinate delay in establishing the McPhee inquiry. This charge before the Senate of a Senate motion is the most serious charge we can move against the Minister, and it is not a charge we move lightly. The charge is that the Minister was clearly negligent in the discharge of his duties and his responsibilities as a Minister of the Crown when he was the Minister for Aviation. A Minister is answerable for the actions of his department, not in minute detail, but in the overall. He is clearly responsible for the efficiency and the drive of that department in fulfilling their duties. And it cannot be pleaded in the case of this Minister that he was ignorant of the charges that uh, the department was not operating in an efficient manner. It is possible, of course, given the complexities of some disaster, uh, departments on some issues, for a minister to claim in perfectly good faith that he has no knowledge of maladministration, and therefore he is not obliged to vicariously accept any shortcomings of any of the officers or servants in his department. But this wasn't the case with Senator Collins. 
Senator Collins had much advice on numerous occasions that things were wrong with the CIA Pat's contract, and he did nothing about it. Now, during his period as a minister, the chief executive of the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, a Mr Baldwin, was appointed. The Civil Aviation Authority, on the advice of Mr Baldwin, abandoned contracts that were worth $200 million that were in train and incurred $48 million in cancellation costs, a cost which was borne not by the department but by the public of Australia. And the department under Mr Baldwin embarked on an ambitious new nationwide air traffic control system. And as soon as it embarked on this, irregularities became apparent in the way the selection process was going to be handled. Those irregularities were small in the first instance, but they became of increasing number and of increasing importance. And a number of questions were asked on both sides of the Senate about the process being followed by the CAA in this matter. Those questions were asked by individual senators and they are asked by the properly constituted authority, the Senate Estimates Committee, and by the Public Works Committee. Senator Collins never answered those questions in a responsible way. Furthermore, he never instructed his department, the Civil Aviation Authority, to answer the questions that were properly put to them in the Estimates Committees. He never advised people like Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards that Parliament is supreme and that when Parliament directs a question through the form of a committee to the officers of the Civil Aviation Authority, they, like every other public servant, had to answer those questions fully, honestly and comprehensively. Now, Mr Deputy President, the questions that were put to Senator Collins in relation to the Civil Aviation Authority were not trivial questions. They were questions that senators were properly asking in the public interest. And it's history now that an independent inquiry, the McPhee inquiry, which reported yesterday to the Senate, found that the worst fears of this chamber were confirmed, that we were dealing with gross professional incompetence in the Civil Aviation Department in the way it handled the TATS contract. You yourself, Mr Deputy President, must feel a particular pride in your part in the Public Works Committee in the way that you sought the truth in the expenditure of public funds on this matter. The Parliament was completely vindicated by the report for the actions of its members. And I'd just like to quote from an independent source, Ms Verona Burgess of the Canberra Times, who wrote in the paper today where she was praising the determination of backbenchers of this Parliament in relation to this issue. And I quote, they persisted that something was very smelly against absolute and categorical denials by the former Minister for Aviation, Bob Collins. What we have before us in this report is a devastating record of professional incompetence. And the matter for the Senate to come to a decision on is what did Senator Collins do about it? Well, every senator who challenged in the form of a question the activities of the Civil Aviation Authority was vilified or denigrated by Senator Collins. If there wasn't an attack on the questioners, Order. there was Order. a support, an unquestioning support for the actions of the authority, a support for its officers, for its activities. We were told incessantly that they were making the best of decisions and it was of the highest probity. Let's have a look at some of the examples of the way Senator Collins dealt with questions. In an answer to me, he said, I trust that the newspaper that gave such prominence to Senator McGibbon's totally false assertion will give similar prominence, having read the Hansard to my correction. Again, I must say that there are similarities between the nonsense that Senator McGibbon has run consistently in this debate. And again, I hope that I will actually have the opportunity of rebutting the nonsense that Senator McGibbon has delivered ridiculous point by ridiculous point. He turned on Senator Lewis as he turned on Senator Macdonald, Senator Achi and anyone else, Senator Bishop, who dared to raise a question. Senator Lewis has done extremely well with that question. Every single thing he said without exception was wrong. 
Senator Lewis demonstrated a fairly profound degree of ignorance on that question last week, but he has just exceeded himself, if that is possible. Again, I have already stated in question time this week for Senator O'Chee's benefit, and it was lost on him because he is obviously not interested in the truth on this issue. Again, I am afraid that the substance of Senator Lewis's question is completely wrong. Again, in answer to that silly interjection from Senator Macdonald, again, for God's sake, if you just belt up, I will finish the bloody answer. It will take a lot less time without stupid interjection. To Senator O'Chee, calm down, chicken little. To Senator Chee again, Senator O'Chee has told an absolute whopper. And finally, on the business of personal attacks, Senator Lewis asked him on the 2nd of April, Mr President, I asked the minister if he will tender his resignation when the things that I have asked him about are proved to be correct. Senator Collins, Senator Lewis, you are a mug. And then it goes on to say, Senator Collins goes on to say, the rank hypocrisy of the opposition on this question, and it is pretty rank, would be demonstrated by a very simple proposition. So much for the personalities. Let's look at the way he had defended the Civil Aviation Authority. He said on another occasion, a lot of nonsense has been delivered in this debate about Thompson. Again, I want to get one thing absolutely clear. The officers of the CAA have been constantly vilified and defamed in print. I think it is outrageous that Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards were named in a newspaper article the other day as having hijacked this matter and made decisions about it. They did nothing of the sort. Again, a number of claims have been made around, about irregularities, some of them quite extraordinary and defamatory, in aspects of the process followed by the CAA in relation to this project. There is no evidence to support any of those claims. And again, on behalf of the Australian taxpayers, I am pleased to say that in extracting the best value for money, it is a very sensible way to proceed. During this 18-week phase, the CAA will have the opportunity of extracting from the preferred tenderer the maximum benefit to Australian industry. But now we come to the piece de resistance, the final quote I want to make, which typifies Senator Collins' approach to the discharge of his duties as a Minister of the Crown. And it comes from an Estimates Committee hearing on the 30th of March, 31st of March, where a question from uh, a senator to the minister was, is the minister entitled to answer questions that he anticipates we will not ask, or is he here to answer the questions we ask? The response from Senator Collins was, I am here to do what I bloody well like, frankly. So much for the way Senator Collins discharged his duties as a minister. Most of the senators in this chamber, Mr Deputy President, would never use the intemperate language that Senator Collins used. But I defend his right to defend his position as a minister defending his department and the actions of his departmental officers. That is not the point at issue. Where Senator Collins failed was in the face of voluminous repeated and informed questioning as to what was going on in the process being conducted by the Civil Aviation Authority, he dismissed those questions in the way I have demonstrated with all those quotes from Hansard. And they're only a small sample of what's in Hansard. Senator Collins failed to demonstrate prudence and common sense in finding out as to whether there was any substance in the questions that were being asked. Now, in Senator Collins' defence, he makes two points, because we've heard him defend his actions on numerous occasions. The first is that he attacks me on the grounds that I had alleged corruption against officers of the department. And Senator Collins, I'll do. Order. I made an interjection that I regret, and I'm quite happy to withdraw that, that I asked you on one occasion whether, whether you— uh, Order. Order. I, the, the question was, I, the, the interjection I made, Senator Collins, about you is I said, what are you getting out of this? Because uh, it was after you demonstrated a particular point of irrelevance in your answering, and I apologise for that. Uh, it was an intemperate remark at the time. But I want to deal with your general allegation that I have alleged corruption against the officers. I have never alleged that at any time. 
and I will read the only time I've referred to corruption in this Senate, either inside or outside. outside. And on the 5th of May in the Senate, I said, I've taken an interest in many tenders since I've been in this place, and I've never seen a selection process conducted like this one. I say to my colleagues that I do not like what I see. I do not see why the Parliament and the people of Australia should tolerate such a process for one moment. On many occasions, I have been aware that there are disappointments at the outcome of tenders. On occasions, I have raised my concerns about the outcome of the selection process, but I have never before heard any criticism of the integrity of a selection process that the Commonwealth entered into, let alone any allegations of corruption. And these are the relevant words. I am now hearing allegations of corruption throughout the aviation industry and in the wider community as to the way this tender was handled. I do not know whether those allegations are true. I have an open mind on the issue, but it is intolerable that the parliament should find itself in the position when it is accountable at the end of the day for the funds involved. And it is perfectly true. There were many allegations out there in the general community about corruption, which led to my raising that as a concern. So Senator Collins' first defence is false. His second defence could be aptly titled the Bannon defence, that he didn't want to know what was going on in the department. He's made great play in this place that he will not interfere in a commercial decision made by any of his departments. And that is perfectly true. No minister should do that. But it is absolutely beside the point. What we're concerned about here, Mr Deputy President, is process how the department was coming to the decisions it came to, not the decision itself. And it's that point which seems to escape Senator Collins. He failed, and he failed dismally, to honour his obligations as a minister when he was told and told repeatedly that something was wrong with the process to investigate, to find out if there was any substance to those claims or allegations. That's his crime, and that's where he fails as a minister. If Senator Collins, if we move back several hundred years and make a hypothetical case, and uh, if Senator Collins was of noble birth and he was of an arms, uh, armidurous family, that they had a coat of arms, the coat of arms of Senator Collins would have a dying, wounded water buffalo on it, because that's the way he approached his ministerial duties. He was unintelligent, he was uncaring, he was irresponsible. Any criticism was met by a bullying response without thinking as to whether or not there might have been substance to the question, whether or not it was in the public interest that those questions were asked. As a minister, as a member of the executive and therefore accountable and answerable to the parliament for the exercises, exercise of the great powers and privileges that he has as a minister of the crown, he has failed to exercise those powers responsibly. He has failed the test of accountability before this parliament. That is why the parliament moves to censure him today. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Collins. Mr President, over the years, censure motions have become such a degraded currency in parliament that they're worth nothing. I have to, uh, to confess that I've added to that uh, process myself. Not this one I don't take seriously, no, Senator. I've, uh, I was ten years in opposition, and I guess I moved more censure motions against uh, ministers in my five years as leader than I've had hot dinners. And this is a classic example, classic example, of the degradation of the value of a censure motion, which is probably why Senator McGibbon didn't have much heart in that previous address. But I welcome it being brought on, because it will give me the opportunity today to place a few facts on the record that perhaps should be placed on the record are not contained uh, anywhere within the McPhee report in terms of the involvement that I did have in the tender, and uh, will perhaps put into context some of these uh, statements made by Senator McGibbon. Now, can I just say uh, that Senator McGibbon said that, the, that when quoting me uh, that he was quoting from just a few examples. Well, that's certainly correct. And not only was he quoting from a few examples, but quoting many of them out of any context whatsoever. I mean, they weren't put into context at all. And I am, I have to say, pleased and appreciative, and I mean that sincerely, of Senator McGibbon's apology to me today, 
uh, here in the parliament for, for his uh, accusation that I had in fact received corruptly uh, kickbacks from uh, Thompson uh, in respect of how this project was managed. Now I accept that, um, that apology in the, in the spirit in which it was given, and I'm appreciative for it today. But I'm glad he's made it, because whatever I have said about this uh, project in response to those comments made by Senator McGibbon has been delivered in the context of, oh, well, uh, I said some hard things. Well, the reason I said some hard things, and Parliament is not a sheltered workshop, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is because some very hard things were being said, as Senator McGibbon has now indicated, on the other side. Not only, not only Mr uh, Deputy President, has, uh, has this uh, been laid bare by the McPhee report, but there's one huge hole in this censure motion. One huge hole in this censure motion. Mr McPhee was given the broadest terms of reference possible. Not only was he given the broadest terms of reference possible, but the minister made it clear in here and was commended by Mr McPhee in the report for doing so that if there was any restriction whatever on the investigations of Mr McPhee, the terms of reference would be further modified so that Mr McPhee could investigate anything he liked. And Mr McPhee, and it's stated in the report, was given access to all of the Hansard records of all of the committees and all of the proceedings here in Parliament. It was absolutely open to Mr McPhee, and in fact it would have been obligatory upon him in investigating this matter to have uh, mentioned my role in the uh, report should he thought it was necessary in terms of any dereliction of duty on my part, and certainly to have questioned me and spoken to me about the role that I played. It was totally open to him to do that, and Senator McGibbon knows it, and he chose not to, and rightly. Nowhere, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, does uh, that appear in the report, and until today I had not even met Mr McPhee. No censure of me here, no criticism of me here in the report, and rightly so. But I do want to place a few uh, facts on the record about my involvement. Now, we have set up these government business enterprises deliberately at arm's length from the government so that there will no be, be no political involvement in the letting of uh, substantial tenders, and you can criticise that process if you wish. You can attack that process if you wish, but you can't reasonably attack ministers for complying with their statutory obligations under those processes and not interfering in the tender process. Because the one thing I have got no doubt about at all, I'm in here this afternoon in this pathetic censure motion being censured because I didn't involve myself. Had I done so, had I directly interfered, I have no question whatever that I would be in here being censured now, as Senator Balkus was, for interfering in a tender. And it might like, uh, members might like to, senators might like to refresh their minds from the Hansard of the 13th of May 1991, when Senator Balkus was in here, Minister Balkus, being attacked by his shadow opposite, Senator Perra. I, and I quote from Senator Perra, I remind the minister that he improperly intervened in a tender. Now, what was this charge? And Senator Panitza, in fact, joined in and said uh, his actions have put the tendering system in jeopardy. What was Senator Balkus's action? Involving himself in a tender for the purpose of ensuring that an Australian company would have an opportunity of tendering. And for doing something as commendable as that, he was put on the coals in here by the same canting, hypocritical, mewling, puking opposition that are in here today taking me to task for in fact doing precisely the opposite. It is hypocrisy of the worst kind. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I will state now Mr. what Chairman. my involvement was and Mr. I will reiterate what I told the Senator Calvert. I, I uh, take exception as being referred to collectively as mewling, puking opposition, and I'd ask the Minister to withdraw. Well, I'm sorry. I did, I, uh, order, order. I'm sorry, Senator Cal, but I didn't hear. Would you repeat your assertion? Well, yes. Well, it's, it verges on, on disorderly, Senator Collins. Um, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, let's let's have a look at my involvement in the process. I had one direct, one direct and aggressive involvement in this tender process, for which I not only do not apologise. But 
of which I advised the parliament properly that I was doing. I wonder if you could stop your non-stop interjection, Senator Macdonald. Mr Acting Dep Deputy President, that was to ensure that there was Australian involvement in this project. And that was one of the issues which led me, Mr Acting Deputy President, to, to begin the process of establishing what became the McPhee inquiry. I acted responsibly, Mr President, and that's where this censure motion falls absolutely to the ground, not just on the hypocrisy of uh, attacking me for involving myself, not involving myself in a tender when they were in here attacking Minister Balkus for doing exactly that, but what my involvement was. Well, I'll explain it to the Senate. I had a great concern that Australian industry got the maximum benefit out of this, and I explained it directly to the board in this way and to the Senate. I said that my primary concern was that the board got for the CAA and for Australia, and Senator McGibbon knows better than most people in this chamber how urgently it's needed, the best state-of-the-art air traffic control system that we could get on price, on budget and so on. Secondary to that, and not by a, short margin, uh, not by a long margin, by a short margin, was that Australian industry should have the maximum involvement in that project. I formally addressed the board twice on that issue in very formal terms and told the board that whichever tenderer was successful, they had to be, so far as the government was concerned, mindful of the maximum involvement of Australian industry in that tender. Mr Acting Deputy President, Senator McGibbon may be interested in this, even if Senator Macdonald isn't, and I think he is. Now, I had to say that I said publicly, Senator Macdonald, I really do wish you would stop ceaselessly interjecting. It's very disorderly. Mr Acting Deputy President, I, Order, Order, Senator Macdonald, you're distracting the minister. And I, I had to is. say, Mr Acting Deputy Sorry. President, I said this to the board, that I would have been delighted if IBM had won the contract on those grounds of Australian involvement. I wasn't suggesting for a minute that they should get it, but I would have been delighted as the minister if the board had taken that decision, because IBM employ 4,600 Australians. They've been established in this country for 60 years, and they export hundreds of millions of dollars' worth already of product from this country. But I had no dispute, as the McPhee report had no dispute, with the technical evaluation process rejecting IBM, because IBM, as Senator McGibbon knows, operate on technology which is from the 60s and which is currently being phased out in the home of IBM in the United States. And it was on those grounds that IBM was taken out of the process, a matter that Mr McPhee found was perfectly appropriate and perfectly correct. But at the end of the process, we had two front runners. And Mr McPhee concludes again, and clearly these critics have not read the report, and certainly Senator O'Chee hasn't read it, and I'll get on to that in a minute, in terms of the outrageous press release he issued yesterday. There were Hughes and Thompson were the front runners. And Mr McPhee said that was also correct and proper. That's the correct decision that the board should have made. They were the front runners. And it is a fact that they were neck and neck. And an examination of the technical evaluation process shows that. Because in every single criteria, on scores out of 100, they were literally points in front or behind on every one of those criteria. And it came down, as Senator McGibbon knows, to that very important issue, as it turned out to be in the minds of the board members, of the actual number of lines of computer code that were contained in the flight data processing components of the, uh, of the system itself. And that was an extremely important consideration in the minds of those members. But that's how close and how tight it was. Mr McPhee finds again correctly that both companies are companies that produce a high quality product which works well. And again, Mr Acting Deputy President, to put into context a lot of those uh, quotes from me, as well as making outrageous uh, accusations of corruption, which Mr McPhee has laid absolutely to rest in this report, outrageous statements were being made about the operation of Thompson Radar. And it would have been irresponsible of me, irresponsible as the Minister for Aviation, to have not strongly rebutted those claims, because Thompson Radar, as well as operating the air traffic control systems in 46 per cent of the world outside the United States and in the whole of New Zealand, also operates air traffic control systems 
in Cairns, Coolangatta, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth, where the people that fly into those ports also are interested in a bit of safe flying. And the non-stop and the, read the report that's contained in there, Senator, and the non-stop public statements of Senator Ochi in particular about unsafe flying conditions at Cairns in particular, and predicting that aircraft were going to collide in the air over Cairns were outrageous and had to be strongly rebutted. And I'm pleased again to see that the McPhee report has absolutely and categorically laid those to rest. And I'll just refer to that particular section of, uh, of the McPhee report, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, where he says this about uh, the constant accusations from Senator Ochi that the Thompson system was unsafe. A very grave statement to make publicly. He says this. The controllers have many years' experience in procedural control. In the review's opinion, the political and media attention given to the difficulties at Cairns and Coolangatta exaggerated the seriousness of the problems being experienced. And it goes on to make a conclusion in, in uh, emphasised type. The review is satisfied that the software problems, although serious, did not create a threat to air safety. And he goes on in another section of the report to indicate that the Thompson systems in all of these places are operating satisfactorily. As I, having visited the towers, personally spoken not just to the controllers but the technicians, and personally viewed as a responsible minister, the problems in those places, after they were reported, were satisfied they were. Because I wasn't simply acting on the appalling statements of Senator Ochi. I personally investigated the matter and was assured by the controllers on the site and the technicians that the radars were in fact operating as safely as Mr McPhee said they were. The person that should be censured in here censured, is Senator Ochi. The outrageous public statement that he issued yeah, oh yeah, have a listen, Senator. Have a listen. This press statement was issued by Senator Ochi yesterday in response to the McPhee report. And it says this unbelievably, and I quote from it. There have been so many doubts expressed about the Thompson radar system that the Australian travelling public can now have very little confidence left with the system. That is an outrageous statement of mistruth that could only have been made by someone who did not even have the decency to read the McPhee report and is now in here censuring me, allegedly, in terms of the findings of it. The McPhee report, of course, absolutely rebutted that. And Senator Ochi might treat lightly, Mr. President, might treat lightly outrageous claims about unsafe air traffic control in Australia. But I can tell you this is the minister responsible. We have got an $8 billion a year tourist industry that hangs off the safe operations and the reputations of those airports. And it is irresponsible, incredibly irresponsible, for people in public life to make public statements, as Senator Ochi did yesterday, alleging that the actual radar systems themselves, the Thompson systems, are inherently unsafe. Well, I've got to tell you, Mr President, if they are, 46 per cent of the world's air traffic control systems are equally unsafe. Mr, President, Mr Deputy President, I addressed the board, as I said, two occasions on the question of Australian involvement in the project. I scrupulously said to the board on both occasions and advised this parliament when I did it that I was not involving myself politically in the tender process, but the government did have a legitimate concern about maximising the value for Australia of these projects. I had numerous meetings with the chief executive and the chairman of the CIA on exactly the same matter. Mr Acting Deputy President, when the CIA shortlisted the tenderers to two, Hughes and Thompson, I was advised I was advised that AWA, a major Australian company, was involved in both tenders, that is Hughes and Thompson. And I was told that, I imagine in good faith, but as I later found out, and I was angry to find out, inaccurately. So I was quite relaxed about that, quite relaxed. As I said, I would like to have seen IBM on the question of Australian involvement have got up, employing 4,600 Australians here and having been in this country for 60 years. I was satisfied they had been technically correctly ruled out, but I was also satisfied when I was told that if Hughes won, AWA won, and if Thompson won, AWA won. Mr Acting Deputy President, Mr. Acting Deputy President the problem was that that was not, in fact, strictly correct, as I later discovered. 
Now, to indicate the importance of this, aside from the FDP component of an air traffic control system, that is the flight data processing heart of the system on which these line codes became the determining factor, according to the report in the minds of half a dozen of the directors, and Dr Edwards gave wrongly weighted advice on that matter, the communication side of air traffic control is a major component of the system. And AWA are, the, are as good as anyone in the world at providing that communications equipment. And I was advised that AWA was an essential component of providing the communications equipment of both final bids, and I remain satisfied of that, until I discovered, to my anger, from AWA that that was not, in fact, strictly correct. Because the situation was that Hughes had entered into an agreement with AWA to provide the communications component of their bid. It was also an option with the Thompson bid. That is, AWA were also involved in the sense that they could have been used as an option for Thompson as well. But Thompson were also offering their own in-house communications equipment, which I had not originally been advised of. And they were offering it at the time I was involved in this at a cheaper price, a cheaper price than AWA could have provided it, because it was explained to me finally when I asked for an explanation that a premium would be charged by Thompson on using someone else's equipment. Now, I was not very happy when I found that out, and I advised uh, the chief executive and the chairman of the board of the CAA that I was not happy. And I have no hesitation in making this public for the first time. I didn't tell Mr McPhee because Mr McPhee rightly considered, even though he had an absolute right to interview me, that it was not required because his report clearly lays the blame where it should be. But I asked the chief executive and the chairman to come and speak to me about that and, they, and, and Dr Edwards and they in fact laid out what the situation was. And this was at the beginning, and I make this clear, of the detailed specification period. It's important to note that because what's been ignored in this debate so far is that no final decision had been taken by the board when this process was interrupted. Thompson had been declared as the preferred contractor, but there was still a detailed specification period to be gone through. And what I said to the chairman, and he accepted it, and to the chief executive, and to Dr Edwards was this. I said, I've got to tell you that I was under the impression, and I see where this misunderstanding has occurred, that AWA, this important Australian communications company, was an essential component of both final bids. I now discover that this is the situation. Is this correct? And I was told it was. And I said to them, well, look, I have to tell you this. If at the end of this specification period, either Thompson or Hughes are chosen, and both the flight data processing part of the, of the system and the communication system are both sourced from overseas when I know that there are world standard Australian companies capable of producing the communications equipment, and I of course was specifically referring to the Thompson bid, I said that the government will be extremely unhappy indeed about the result of that tender process. Now I have no difficulty in placing that on the record because I said before unblushingly that my only direct political involvement in this process was in asserting the government's concern about maximising the job creation for Australians, the technical flow on returns for Australians by involving Australian companies. I was then assured that my uh, very strong comments had been noted and uh, they, uh, they then departed. I then, because of that concern, and Senator Schott alluded to this last night, and indeed even Senator Calvert did in a, in a comment last night which was correct about my alleged preferences. And I have to say he's right. And I confirm that he's right, which just shows you uh, how much involvement I had. Because if I had any preference, it was for that tenderer, con knowing that both of them were neck and neck technically, that employed more Australians than the other. And I don't step back from that. I then, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, put in train the processes for establishing an independent inquiry that we're now debating here today, in which I don't feature in a, in a critical sense. I called the two most senior officers of my department over, Mr Evans, the secretary, and the associate secretary, Mr Beale, and this was held over a period of some months, and it culminated in two meetings in May, in May, where we actually got down to the detailed discussion of how this inquiry would be set up 
what classes of people would be involved in it. And I can remember, for example, a suggestion was made, oh, perhaps the Auditor General could do it, and I said, no, I think it should be conducted by an eminent lawyer, totally independent of the Commonwealth, totally independent of the CIA, no Commonwealth government involvement, and I was given detailed advice on the procedures involved. The facts are, Mr Deputy President, that I've just indicated, I acted scrupulously correctly. I responded certainly aggressively and robustly, but they were responses to ridiculous attacks on Australia's air traffic control system, stupid attacks on a company which has got a world-established record for providing safe air traffic control systems, which Mr McBee, of course, has absolutely alluded to. Now, I know, Mr President, I know, Mr. President that Senator O'Chee is about to speak. And I would like to ask Senator O'Chee, seeing it's coming up to Christmas, which is the heaviest user time of the year for our air traffic control systems, it's when most people fly in this country, how he can responsibly, on the basis of this report, make a public statement yesterday as a senator in this country alleging that the air traffic control systems at Cairns, Coolangatta, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth are unsafe because they operate with Thompson radar systems when I know, and Mr McPhee has stated categorically in this report, that nothing of the, of the sort is the truth. And as I said before, I, I deliberately exclude Senator McGibbon from this because Senator McGibbon, as Mr McPhee says rightly, is a, uh, a, a, well, I'll say an expert. He is certainly highly skilled in terms of his background. But I say, and I assert this now, that Senator O'Chee is the one that should be being censured in here, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. And I would like Senator O'Chee to do something for me now when he speaks. Find the section of the McPhee report which allows him to claim that the air traffic control systems in most of our major city centres are unsafe. Quote that from the McPhee report, and if he can't find it, I'd like him to publicly withdraw that allegation now so that people aren't frightened either here or overseas, of using our airports. Order. The question is, Senator O'Chee. Acting Deputy President, uh, the speech we've just heard is rather like watching the Goodyear blimp, because it really was full of hot air, totally full of hot air, but very, very thin on real facts. And I think it's about time that we got down to some real facts again. Senator McGibbon gave a very good exposition of the real facts. I intend to follow up on the real facts instead of the assertions that Senator Collins has made. Now, if you listen to this debate, Senator Collins would have you believe that he was the saviour of the Australian air traffic control system. He would have you believe that he was the one personally responsible for this inquiry. He would have you believe he was personally responsible for ensuring that we had the review, and he would have you believe that here he was, some sort of omniscient, omnipotent um, grandfather figure, hanging over the uh, place, uh, uh, ready to pounce on the slightest, the slightest uh, whiff of anything uh, that was wrong in the process. Of course, that is not borne out by the facts. And those of us in this chamber have a very good recollection of how Senator Collins dealt with the allegations that have been made about the process, about the operation of the systems, and ultimately about whether the result was fair and accurate. And Senator McGibbon has gone through some of the things today that Senator Collins said to honourable senators on this side of the chamber in estimates hearings when we tried to, to ask questions about this. For example, my colleague Senator Macdonald was told to shut up and stop making silly interjections. Other honourable senators were told they were stupid. He told the Estimates Committee that he was going to do as he bloody well liked. Language which is wholly unacceptable, but even worse because it evidences an attitude which showed a total and utter disregard for the concerns that were being raised, not just on this side of the chamber, but on the other side of the chamber as well. And I would say this to those who sit in judgment on this censure motion today. This censure motion is not about the CAA. It is not about Mr Baldwin and Edwards per se, although their background, their activities and their character are relevant factors. 
This censure motion is about how Minister Collins conducted himself both in and outside this chamber as the relevant minister who was responsible for this portfolio. And when a serious allegation about the operational standard of a radar system or about the tender processes or about the people who preside over those tender processes is raised, it is never, never appropriate for a minister of the Crown to abuse honourable senators and say they are stupid, to say they are ignorant, or to say to them, when they are endeavouring on behalf of the Australian public to raise very real concerns, that he will do as he bloody well likes. That is not acceptable. And that in itself ought to be the basis for a censure motion against Minister Collins. It ought to be the basis for a censure motion which can proceed on those facts alone. But this censure motion does not rely solely on that. And in fact, uh, Senator McGibbon has gone further, and I intend to go further now myself, and show that what we had was a consistent pattern of incompetence or unwillingness on behalf of Senator Collins to listen to the facts, to treat them with open ears, and to realise for once in his life that those of us on this side are not necessarily people who are out to score a political point, but people with very real fears. Now, Senator Collins wishes to address comments that have been made about the radar systems in Cairns. Fine. I'm happy to do that. All senators on this side are happy to do it. While we're at it, we should address the radar system in Melbourne, because Senator Collins has referred to it. Now, while Senator Collins was talking, my friend and colleague on this side, Senator Calvert, who was on the Public Works Committee, told me about the very real concerns that air traffic controllers had expressed to the Public Works Committee about the operation of the radar systems in Melbourne. And lest anybody here believe the sort of stuff that we've heard from Senator Collins, it's not just a case of missing planes, but it's a, it's a problem, in fact, that we had for a long time incorrect slant ranges on the aircraft uh, on the screens, so they could be miles away from the proper position. And the air traffic controllers themselves said that the reason the reason why they delayed aircraft into Melbourne for a very long period of time, why the, the separation range was increased from what it was originally intended to be, was because at the original separation range it would not have been proper to operate the air traffic control system as the primary means of separating aircraft in that airspace. They had to change the specifications, and only after changing the specifications were the air traffic controllers the people who, at the end of the day, wear the flak if something goes wrong. Only then, only after changing the, the parameters, were they happy to continue using it, and only because they didn't have an alternative. And that, you see, is the true measure of the, of the, uh, of the gravitas of this situation. It is really about a system which was not performing adequately. But it goes further than that, because Having established the system did not perform adequately, and everybody knows it didn't. Everybody knows it didn't. Air traffic controllers were coming to people on this side and to the other side of the chamber and saying, these are our fears and these are our concerns. Yeah, Senator, Kernow Senator Kernow raised a matter about it, again, on information provided by air traffic controllers and by engineers. So having established that there was a problem, the next question is, what did the minister do about it? The minister would have us believe that he immediately moved to set up this review. Utter nonsense. The minister, in fact, spent week after week, month after month in this chamber, every time one of us on this side of the chamber got up and asked a question about it, calling us uh, sleazy, calling us um, uh, disreputable, calling us uh, dishonest, calling us stupid or calling us silly. Yet at the end of the day, the comments that we made about how the process, the evaluation process, was awry were proved to be correct. And the real problem for Senator Collins is that Senator Collins, Senator Collins would have us believe that, uh, that his only involvement in this was in relation to the Australian content of the system. Well, that is not correct because I intend to convict Senator Collins on his own words. 
These were his words in answer to a colleague of mine, Senator Macdonald, who asked a question about the process in estimates committees on the 31st of March this year. And Senator Collins said, and I quote, I described this as being rubbish, and it was, that this particular process that put the CAA in a weak position. In fact, it is as good a position for getting maximum benefit to the travelling public as I have seen. Now, the point, Senator Collins, is that in this report, which you, uh, in your usual fashion, assert that those of us on this side of the chamber have not read, in this report, Mr McPhee says that the process weakened the position of the CAA. So Senator Collins can't just say that he was solely concerned with the Australian content of it. Senator Collins had obviously made inquiries, or I would hope he had made inquiries, about the process for him to make that sort of comment. Either he made inquiries and was totally duped as a minister, for which he must wear the responsibility, or he made, in, he made assertions in the estimates committee. He made assertions in the estimates committee that would lead one to believe he had made inquiries, when in fact none had been made at all. And that is the way Senator Collins has always operated his portfolio responsibilities. Operations of portfolio responsibilities on the basis of assertion, and not on the basis of fact. And then, of course, uh, Senator Collins would have us believe that when he started to set up the independent process of review, he insisted that there be absolutely no government contact at all. And yet we find, of course, that the first person proposed by Senator Cook, who, if we believe Senator Collins picked up the bundle, the first person proposed was Mr Pat Brazel former secretary of the Attorney General's Department. But this was after Senator Collins ceased to have ministerial responsibility for this. After Senator Collins ceased to have ministerial responsibility for this. So he can't say that the proposal was put up and then he vetoed it because he was no longer Minister for Shipping and Aviation Support at that point in time. Yes. So that is why Senator Collins is again convicted on his own words. But finally, I think we should go to the people that Senator Collins was so busily defending in this chamber and the people Senator Collins was so busily defending in the Estimates Committee. One Mr Frank Baldwin, one Dr Rob Edwards. Because Senator Collins knows, and it was pointed out to him, not only by honourable senators on this side of the chamber, but he also knows, because it was pointed out to him by civil air, that these gentlemen were the subject of a parliamentary committee of inquiry in New Zealand into exactly the same sorts of matters that were raised here. And one thing, and one thing alone should be sufficient to show that there was no proper exercise of ministerial responsibility. And that is that Dr Rob Edwards appeared at the first hearing day of that inquiry in New Zealand whilst he was still an employee of Airways Corporation. And it was only after the first hearing day, and only after it was patently obvious from a public inquiry there are questions over Dr Edwards' uh, ability to perform his task or his uh, adequacy for the job. It was only after that that Dr Edwards resigned and in fact took up a place with CAA. And if this minister had been doing his job, it would be totally and utterly unsatisfactory for this minister to allow the CAA to appoint as head of its projects division a man who was under inquiry for his management of projects in New Zealand. Whether that inquiry, whether that inquiry was to vindicate him or otherwise, it would be wholly unacceptable for this minister to allow that to go on. Now, Senator Collins has just interjected it was a board appointment. Yet Senator Collins has also indicated in this chamber that he, is, uh, he has had no qualms about demonstrating to the board, in quote his words, in a robust fashion, 
end of quote, his views, to, to shove his views down their throat. So why didn't he shove his views down their throat on this matter? Was it because he was ignorant or was it because he couldn't care less? Those of us on this side do care about the operation of the Civil Aviation Authority, and we do care about the people who are appointed by the Civil Aviation Authority to oversee the most important contract that the Civil Aviation Authority was to sign. Not my words, but the words of Mr McPhee. And that is why we get to the situation where, uh, where Senator Collins, for manifest reasons, has been, has been convicted on his own words and on his own failure to perform his task properly. That is why Senator Collins has been brought in here today, not out of a sense of, of political, uh, political expediency, not out of a sense of, 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 of knife twisting or anything of the contrary, because those of us on this side of the chamber staunchly refused to make this a political debate when we were seeking to have an inquiry. That is why those of us on this side of the chamber could have, for example, tabled enormous amounts of well, Senator Collins, you know, you're a man who, who, who's known to keep uh, a special regard for the truth. You save it for special occasions. Perhaps it might be better, though, if you stopped your interjections and kept them for a special occasion, a special occasion when you're right. Now, what we have here with, with uh, this matter is a whole situation where the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility for this contract went awry from sometime around about December or maybe earlier. And it was months and months and months, six months in fact, that Senator Collins had responsibility for it when he did nothing about setting up an inquiry. It was six hours when Senator Cook had responsibility for this portfolio in which he did set up the inquiry. And that, that you see, is the true measure of Senator Collins' culpability. Six hours it took Senator Cook to realise there was something wrong. Six months it took Senator Collins, and still there was no inquiry. Six hours versus six months. And that in itself is evidence that Senator Collins should be censured. And finally, I'd like to say something else. Senator Collins continues in this chamber to slur members of this side of the chamber. We do not find that acceptable. We do not find Senator Collins' attitude to this matter to be at all acceptable. And we do not find on this side of the chamber Senator Collins to be fit to hold a ministerial office, and that is why this censure motion has been moved. Senator Collins wants to, wants to, wants to go on the attack, wants to badmouth members of this side of the, of, the, of the parliament, but that will not do. What Senator Collins has failed to do today is to defend himself. What Senator Collins has failed to do is to defend his lack of action. And what Senator Collins has failed to do is to defend his lack of integrity when it's come to these issues because of the way in which he has misled this Senate. That is why this motion should be supported. That is why Senator Collins should be censured. And that is why he is no longer fit to be a minister in this or any other government. Order. Senator. Senator. Order. I have no knowledge of any agreement. I, I, in, I intend to speak for two minutes. Uh, Senator MacDonald. I, I understand the next speaker, Senator Bell, is not uh, quite ready, uh, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Senator Bourne is not quite ready then. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, just for a couple of minutes, I, I just want to bring the Senate back to the terms of the uh, censure motion. Uh, uh, which is that the uh, Senate censure the minister for his persistent failure to immediately investigate the, invest uh, the allegations of irregularities. Mr Acting Deputy President, as my colleagues uh, Senator McGibbon and Senator O'Chee have very clearly and succinctly pointed out, uh, over a long period of time they, Senator Archer, Senator Calvert, the Public Works Committee, everyone else told Senator Collins about this. They told him he should look at it a bit closer. They told him something uh, was wrong, and he continued to ignore it. All he did, all he did, was abuse those that were suggesting he should look at it. All he did was tell us to shut up, uh, tell us to be quiet, tell us that he'd do what he bloody well liked, and uh, took absolutely no notice 
when we were trying to tell him what it was all about. We were trying to say to him he should look at Mr Baldwin's administration of uh, the uh, department, that he should be a bit careful about what was happening. And This is what so Senator Collins said in response to that. Mr Baldwin is a very professional administrator. He is a very good one. Now, I don't think Mr McPhee agrees with that. People on this side were trying to say to uh, uh, Senator Collins, look at it, have a look at it, see, see that there's not something going wrong. Senator Cook was able to take up the uh, challenge. Within a few short hours, Senator Cook was able to uh, attend to it. Senator Collins, for many, many months, was told about this, but refused to do anything about it, refused to do anything except uh, uh, protect and, and promote and praise uh, the people uh, that have now been uh, uh, reported on in this particular uh, motion. I, and, and abuse, uh, as Senator O'Chee says, and abuse um, uh, those of us um, on this side. Now, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, I think the case has been very well made out. Uh, in my speech yesterday, uh, I raised a lot of issues, which I won't repeat again today. I did then call upon Senator Collins to do the right thing and resign. If he doesn't, uh, Mr Keating, if he had any courage at all or any uh, concern about the, uh, the way uh, Parliament operates, should sack him and uh, so benefit the whole of Australia. But I urge uh, the Senate. Uh, right. You right? But I, I urge uh, the Senate to support the motion. Senator Kerno. Oh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The Democrats think that the question is whether the minister persistently failed to investigate allegations of irregularities and whether we can prove that that really was an inordinate delay anyway. And as far as we can see, the timeline is this that in mid March, the tender was determined by early April when Public Works Committee started the inquiry into the building's works involved in TATS. Obvious problems were surfing, surfacing in relation to the tender process. In early May, Senator Collins began discussions with his department about setting up an inquiry. On the 27th of May, Senator Cook took over the portfolio. On the 3rd of June, the Public Works Committee tabled its report and recommended an inquiry be held into the awarding of the contract to Thompson. And on the 11th of July, the inquiry started. So we have a period, technically, of about six weeks between the determination of the tender and Senator Collins's first discussions with officers of his department about setting up an inquiry. Three weeks later, yes, three weeks later, 31st of March to May, is that inordinate? Senate, three weeks later, Senator Cook was the minister responsible. Now, one week after that, the Public Works Committee recommended an inquiry. Five weeks later, Mr McPhee had been appointed and the inquiry had started. So, I mean, yet you have to judge. There are a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions, but are they about Senator Collins or are they, or are they about the bigger question of the role of GBEs, the concept of arm's length? Well, I think they could well be. And are there questions about the actions of Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards, for example? Now, let me put on the record that the Democrats believe that there is a strong case that the two executives most responsible for this debacle, Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards, should be dismissed immediately. We think it's inconceivable that Hughes could have any confidence in the rerun tender process if those two officials are reinstated. There is also sufficient evidence to warrant a review of the appointment of the chairman and the deputy chairman, Mr Ted Butcher and Mr Henry Bosch. They oversaw, in our view, a clearly flawed process and appeared to us not to properly and independently question the judgment and action of the two senior executives in question, Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards. Mr Butcher is, after all, the chairman of the National Rail Corporation as well as the Civil Aviation Authority, and he surely must take responsibility for the haphazard and hasty sequence of events leading to the decision to favour Thompson over Hughes, and his position in the NRC, in the National Rail Corporation, is critical to the national interest, and reassurance as to his judgment and his determination to act is needed. Now, I, in response to one of Senator Macdonald's interjection, I said, really, what's happened here raises the big question of the role of GBEs. 
the way in which this government, with the support of the opposition who said, yes, 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 corporatise, you must corporatise, not as good as privatising, but it's, but it's a good first step along the road. So it raises the question of the role of GBEs, their relationship with government, the notion of what arm's length really should mean in relation to GBEs. Now, Mr McPhee said, as I understand it, that he felt that the chief executive and the board either did not know or did not properly understand the Civil Aviation Act, uh, which established the CAA, in that it seemed to him that they interpreted the interpreted that act to mean that the sole purpose of the CAA was to operate on a commercial basis. And again, uh, I think the assumption is that um, the relationship between government and GBE, in this case the C Civil Aviation Authority, was akin to one between a board and shareholders. But the Democrats would argue strongly that because the government has ownership there is a more direct sense of, of control and responsibility that is required. And although the government does have many government business enterprises under its authority, we think that it's the old line, horses for courses, that there are some which quite obviously it may wish to, say, have a primary uh, objective of operating commercially, but there are quite clearly others where the prime consideration is the purpose of delivering public good. And if I can read from Mr McPhee's report, chapter two, the board of, this is page 11, quite clearly specifies the board of the CAA has the purposes, A, to decide the objectives, strategies and policies to be followed by the authority, and B, to ensure that the authority performs its functions in a proper, efficient and economical manner. Now, this does not mean that its sole objective is to operate on a commercial basis. Also, Mr McPhee suggested that there were other considerations that governments ought to have in mind. And on page 13, he, he lists an indicative and far from exhaustive list of the possible objectives of the government to be met by the CAA beyond the efficient production of the specified products of the CAA. And he talks in, in the first instance about the provision of safety in relation to civil aviation. He talks about artificial deterrence to demand for or supply of civil aviation. Now, the first one is quite clearly a public good. The second one he describes as reducing the incidence and therefore the cost of externalities. He talks about assistance to Australian industry to meet the wider policy objectives of producing a portfolio of goods and services. So I think I remember when we debated this a couple of years ago, and we talked about what a wonderful delivery of services we were going to get from this corporatised CAA. I think we should look again. We should say it has failed to, to deliver. In one, in one sense, we have a GBE which clearly seems to be ignoring its uh, purpose and its major considerations beyond commercial. We need, the government needs to take a good, long and hard look at the way the CAA board is interpreting the act which establishes it. And the whole point of the comments that I have made uh, lead me to ask again, what is the point of having corporatisation? What is the point if we're just going to have a board at arm's length making these sorts of decisions, costing this amount of money for a review, and a government standing back. I hope this will cause the government to look more closely at its relationship, not just with this government business enter enterprise, but with all its government business enterprises. What is it at the call? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to ask the opposition to reconsider this motion and preferably withdraw it, and if, if not, uh, for the Senate to defeat it. Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, it's uh, somewhat invidious of me, for me as the responsible minister to be put in a position of having to speak on the independent review of the CAA so soon after the report has uh, been tabled. 
because some matters that arise from the report are in action and in hand now, and I think it is in the public interest and the interests of the parliament that uh, those actions be carried through and dealt with fully and properly and, uh, and uh, attended to uh, in a way in which they can be without the issues uh, being taken at a political level in a way that may well distort the outcomes. The, uh, the McPhee report is an important report, of that there is no doubt. And as I say, the dealing of the effects with, uh, of that report have, has some time to run and is not yet complete. One of the uh, key issues, until the uh, report has been properly dealt with and completed, is the morale and integrity of the CAA and its ability to oversee air safety and regulation in Australia. And uh, quite clearly, when a report of this character is, is, is tabled, it must have a damaging impact on morale. I think we ought not add to that uh, unnecessarily. The other reason why I rise, however, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, is I don't want to see an injustice done. And if this uh, motion were carried, I think an injustice would be done to my colleague, uh, Senator Collins. There uh, uh, are three, four points that I would wish to make, and I'll make them hopefully succinctly and briefly and then resume my seat. Four points that I think put beyond question that this motion should not succeed if it is not withdrawn. The first is the, if you like, the logistical possibilities of uh, the practical life of government. That is the timeline between the critical decisions. Uh, the Democrats have just uh, put down what, what appears to me to be about the right timetable. And uh, I think from that timetable it can be seen that uh, government moved with haste and propriety moved with haste and propriety uh, and dealt with this uh, promptly. The second point I make is the charter given to the independent inquirer, Mr McPhee. He had, uh, to put it in the colloquial, an open slather, and uh, he was properly uh, able to report on any matter that engaged his attention about this issue, and he did so. And uh, he was invited to report the brutal truth of the circumstances as he found them. He entered no finding against uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Collins, uh, nor did he enter a finding against uh, the board, but he did enter a finding against the officers of the, of the uh, authority. And uh, I think that has got to be respected, because if uh, Mr McPhee believed there was some improper conduct by the minister, his charter was that he would report that. And I think uh, it is uh, true that Mr McPhee, and certainly it's one of the reasons why uh, I thought he was an appropriate choice for the inquiry, that Mr McPhee is widely regarded as an, as an iconoclastic individual, able to withstand criticism if he makes unpopular decisions. And if his decision and finding in this case were unpopular with us, I don't think that would deter him, as a government, I don't think that would deter him from making them. And uh, he, the fact that he didn't, uh, and he has that reputation, I think has got to be respected. Third point is one that I've just alluded to, the chain of responsibility. This comes uh, in for some discussion in the report. The chain of the responsibility is from the authority to the board to the minister. The board is responsible on behalf of the authority to the minister. The proper connection is the chairman of the board to the minister. The debate in the report is about other lines of authority to the parliament and I think that they are quite properly drawn observations in the report. Uh, however, um, I, I think to, uh, to admonish the minister for the conduct of the officers ignores the chain of command, and that is not appropriate in logic or in fact in these circumstances. The fourth point that I make uh, is that uh, neither I nor Senator Collins had very much warning that uh, our portfolio arrangements would be changed. And uh, I certainly didn't, and I'm pretty sure no, nor did Senator Collins. This Senate, above all chambers in Australia, is probably very familiar with the, with the uh, cause and effect of the circumstances, the resignation of the then Minister, Senator Richardson. Uh, and as someone who has been, uh, according to the pecking order, so-called promoted from one portfolio to another, you always leave a portfolio to take your newer and higher responsibilities with some element of regret. You have regret because 
any minister worth their salt on whatever, whatever side of the House commits themselves to a program of involvement with their portfolio, and if that, that uh, tenure is truncated unexpectedly, you have got projects running that you want to complete that are important in your view and that you invested effort and time into that you can't complete, and you are called to, uh, to other duties. Someone comes in and then completes them for you, and uh, in some cases they get criticised for doing what you would have done and wear the blame. In other cases, they get the praise for doing what they would have what you would have done and take the credit. Uh, I have to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, that uh, I am absolutely certain in my mind that uh, uh, had there not been a change in portfolio responsibility from Senator Collins to me, there would have been, uh, in any case, under Senator Collins's uh, stewardship, an independent inquiry uh, of the sort that we have now got. I should also say that uh, uh, not only am I confident about that, but uh, when the uh, baton changed from Senator Collins to me, when the baton changed from Senator Collins to me, as a new uh, Tyro minister, it was incumbent on me, as I saw it, to consult deeply with Senator Collins about some of these uh, transitional managerial issues, and uh, I did on the subject of the inquiry, on the subject of the appointment of the inquirer, on the subject of the terms of reference to the inquiry, and on the subject of uh, the, uh, the licence the inquirer would have, and on the issue, which was a critical one at the time, as to whether the uh, uh, process of, uh, of the, uh, of the um, um, Thompson uh, bid should be discontinued while the inquiry was being conducted or not. And uh, uh, while, of course, ministers take responsibility for own decisions, uh, I leant heavily on the crutch of Senator Collins' advice and counsel in those matters. So I uh, regard the transition in the portfolio responsibility from him to me as being as seamless uh, and without, without a, uh, a, uh, a dislocated break between portfolio responsibilities as any government would want it to be when their, when their ministerial responsibilities are changed. For those four reasons, I uh, ask that the opposition consider the withdrawal of this motion. If they don't, I ask the Senate to defeat it. Uh, Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman. In closing the debate, uh, I'll deal with the speakers in the inverse order in which they spoke. And uh, It's not possible, Senator uh, Cook, for the Senate to accept your plea. Uh, withdraw this motion, the debate has clearly demonstrated that beyond any shadow of doubt, let alone reasonable doubt, Senator Collins is guilty of the charge. He failed to responsibly discharge the duties vested in him. I listened with great uh, interest to what uh, Senator uh, Cook had to say, but like so many other speakers in this uh, debate, he failed to deal with the issue before the chair which is not a debate about how the department operates or the authority operates or anything like that. The debate is about what Senator Collins did or did not do as a matter of fact. I agree very much with Senator Cook's plea that the morale of the department should not be damaged. But as someone who knows the department intimately and has for 20 or 30 years, I can tell you that the morale is very, very da badly damaged at the present time. And, uh, while any change in the morale is to be deplored, it is a matter of degree, of slight degree, that uh, the morale is worse today than it was yesterday. I'd like to thank the Democrats for a nice, sensitive support for the government once more. It must be about 40 years since someone tried to teach me in any Latin, but uh, I still remember that slogan that used to be on those great uh, buildings that the AMP invested their funds in in all the country towns with a statue on the top and a slogan underneath, Amicus Curtis in Re in Curta, which to my uh, distant uh, Latin thinking means a certain friend in uncertain times. And uh, politics is a matter of shifting loyalties, but uh, at least the Labor Party have the great luxury that I don't think any other party has enjoyed in politics in the Australian Parliament of knowing that it doesn't matter how black the night the Democrats are there plodding along loyally, uncritically, giving them unfailing support. It's funny, it's funny you never it's, say uh, that when they support you. It just you, keeps sir. on and on. <laughs> now, I would like to. You never say that when they support you. I don't you. wish. I, uh, 
I, I don't wish. I don't wish to dignify this light and lightweight right contribution of the Democrats with respectability by dissecting it in detail. But great play was made by uh, the Speaker for the Democrats, Senator Kernow, about the fact that the government somehow, because it reacted in oh, something like uh, five or six months, had acted with great expedition. Oh, six weeks. Well, <laughs> that makes your case even worse, Senator Kernow, because I just happen to have reasonably good briefs with me when I move on something, and all these pages deal with the chronology of the TATS contract. And I find that the leading question in relation to me was asked on the 10th of September, oh, sure. 1991. Now I realise well, from your prognostications on the uh, oh, what? Uh, economic scene, Senator Kernow, that you don't share the great distinction in mathematics that uh, a lot of us in this chamber have. But I would think it's rather appalling to claim that the 10th of September was only 1991 was only six weeks before the inquiry was initiated. And for the rest of the time of the Democrats, we had this discourse about GDBs and other irrelevances. The point at issue is that Senator Collins, in his own speech, in his own defence, failed to establish that he had effectively coped with the abundant evidence that was, taught, that was given we'll divide, won't we? that yes. things were wrong, seriously wrong, in the authority. He talked about the instructions he gave to the board on numerous occasions. To the greatest of respect, utterly irrelevant, nothing to do with the motion. He talked about the business of direct interference, of how he wouldn't dare to interfere in a commercial outcome. Again, nothing to do with the motion before the chair. Senator Collins never had the courage to take the charge on and defend himself against it. And the charge is that when he was faced with overwhelming evidence that the process by which the outcome of a major commercial contract was being grossly uh, distorted and being conducted in an improper and incompetent way, he did nothing about it. And the facts speak for themselves. The chronology of the events speak for himself. The moment Senator Cook came in, literally, or metaphorically, uh, we had an inquiry. Senator Collins did nothing. And I would quote from chapter 11 of the uh, McPhee report, because in one Senator. sentence on page 88 of the report it says, under no test of fair play or professional competence could the methods of inquiry or the quality of the conclusions, they're talking here about the TAPS contract, during the post-December 1991 phrase be regarded as being adequate. That sums it up. That was the point that members on both sides of the parliament were making. The process was flawed and fatally flawed. That was found to be a matter of fact by the inquiry. That is what we're saying today. What we're saying is Senator Collins failed to listen to the critics of the program and intercept it, take the appropriate action at a time when a great deal of trauma, hurt and expense for the Australian public would have been saved. That is why he is negligent in the discharge of his duties. That is why we unhesitatingly find him today guilty of not discharging the responsibilities that have vested him in him as a minister. I therefore move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division. Ring the bell. Yeah, listen to Senator Cook, Senator McGill. I know that you never defended the chair. I was too tired of time. That's my practice. You
little bit yeah. going on. Yeah, but what is it? What is it? Not well, theoretically, you can do it within eight hours. Oh, second. Yeah. As well as you could do it within eight hours, oh, but yeah. we'd probably operate on 14 days for full day. Yeah, I'm But that's what it's. it's but that is that what it's going to be? No, hmm? Is that what you? We haven't determined a readiness for the second device on the. For the period of time that'll be up. Yeah, yeah. Now, what I was wondering, what we wanted would be the normal readers well, of, the, of, the, of the of the second. Of the second. Oh. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the uh, censure motion moved by Senator McGibbon be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the ayes and Senator Jones teller for the noes.
Order. Result of the division there being 31 ayes and 37 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Order. Would honourable senators, honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? Those honourable senators standing, take a seat or leave the chamber. I might uh, call Senator Bishop for a moment. Sen Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, I seek leave to present three positions which are not in conformity with the standing orders as the petitions pardon me, take that out, which are not in conformity with the standing orders as they are not in the correct form. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I present to the Senate three petitions, similar in wording, from 240, 888 and 5,470 petitioners, respectively, requesting that the Senate ensure that the Australian national flag is not changed or replaced without first being voted upon and approved by the people of Australia in a national referendum. National referendum. I move that the petitions be received. The question is that the petitions be received. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Short. Mr. Deputy President, uh, I wanted to, do, wanted to do this after question time, but I seek your uh, guidance as to whether I can do it now. And that is uh, that, in accordance with the resolution of the Senate of the 28th of September 1988 relating to unanswered questions on notice, uh, I ask, uh, wish to ask uh, Senator Collins for an explanation as to why my question on notice number 2170, which has been on the notice paper since the 20th of August, that is for four months, uh, uh, has not uh, been answered. Uh, in doing so, I, I point out that this is my second such request, the first being on the 4th of November 1992. I also point out that the unanswered question was one asked of all departments, and uh, given that DASIT is uh, now the only department not to have responded. I do wish to uh, just place on the record my uh, concern and disappointment and criticism, I guess, of the, uh, the minister that this matter has been allowed to uh, remain outstanding for so long. I did give Senator Collins notice uh, earlier uh, about this matter. Um, uh, if I may uh, uh, respond uh, on that, Mr. Yeah, Mr. I, could, mm. could I have the standing order? Uh, Senator, I, I'm, I'm just, um, I, I just want to check whether we we can do it here. I, I think that uh, this is probably not the time, but I'd just like to check. I'd just, uh, if I may, indicate to uh, Senator Short, I'll pass that on to Senator Collins. I assure you uh, his absence from the chamber is not a discourtesy. As you know, he's been involved in the censure motion and the concurrent cabinet meeting, an item which uh, is a major consideration for him. And he sort of, as I understand it, if that meeting's on, he's rushed off there, and that's why he hasn't been able to be present. 